Hey everybody, this is Carlos Ocelot and welcome to the G2 podcast. Today is a wonderful day. First of all, because as you guys can see, well, we've, we've changed the setup a little bit. We bought some fancy stuff, some expensive fancy stuff. Good job, production. Um, it's the episode number four. I'm actually so happy. You know, I was looking forward for this one. We were thinking so very much about, you know, who to bring today. And, um, you know, we thought about, should we bring another player? Should we bring kind of uh, someone closer to G2? But we, we kind of wanted to, um, you know, break the mold a little bit. And we wanted to a little bit, you know, challenge ourselves and challenge myself, you know, and bring someone um, that pretty much everybody that follows esports knows and someone that has been historically very outspoken, but someone that undeniably has helped uh, the industry grow and the industry become more and more, um, you know, legit, you can say. Um, this person is called Richard Lewis, and I am so incredibly happy of having him here. How's it going, Richard? Oh, it's going great, Carlos. Um, it's good to finally talk to you after all this time. I, I can't remember the last time I saw you. It was at an event. I, I can't remember where it was. I think Germany. I think we were at some ESL event together, and um, yeah, I think we, we, we probably were. We probably were. Uh, let's just say Twitch partying. after party. Yeah, yeah. Twitch after party. It was. <laughs> uh, that's probably why I don't I remember, remember anything about it. No, I do. I do. Re <laughs> I do remember it. I remember it. And uh, we had the yeah. It was back in the we had the um, G two Kingwin team with uh, yeah, that was Cream, uh, Michael L. Mm -hmm. um, I think also Dennis, Rain. It was an amazing team, actually. Really good team. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I actually remember that day. It was actually really fun. And you literally were like just walking around, meeting everybody and say, you know, just, just being <laughs> your, your, your usual self. A little bit drunk, just like all of us. But oh, always. It was, it, was, <laughs> it was a wonderful night. I had so much fun. So, you know, in, in preparation, actually, for, for this podcast, I was just, mm. I was just, just for two seconds, I saw that you were, you were uh, wearing a McGregor t-shirt. I am. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, the right thing to do these days, because obviously... <laughs> yeah. um, Motherfucker, he really he, fucked up. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's gone off the fucking rails just a bit. And on, uh, honestly, that shit that he pulled recently with the, uh, the, the chair through the uh, coach and you know putting glass in someone's eyes it's like it, it is inexcusable you know we all love conor mcgregor the fighter but like ufc has got to take uh, he's gonna get sued to fuck now like all the money he's For made sure yeah he's gonna lose a big chunk of it and on a serious note as somebody that um has like you know done boxing and, and mma and stuff in the past like the, the if, a, if a fighter in my corner had been like nearly blinded because of something like that and had to duck out of a fight that they trained so hard for. I think me as the fucking corner guy, I'd make sure Conor McGregor couldn't fight in his next fight neither. Like, you know what I mean? For it's sure. so monumentally fucked up what happened for, for multiple reasons. So, but it, but actually, because I live in Vegas now, uh, I actually got <laughs> this. I think, I think it was the Nate Diaz fight. I think it is. Mm, yeah. So I actually got this when I didn't live in Vegas. I came out for the night of the fight. Watched it in a bar around the corner. I couldn't get tickets for it, despite having the hookups. Uh, they were just too fucking crazy expensive and hard to get hold of. Uh, but yeah, so uh, Conor McGregor and Vegas, you know. And now me in Vegas. This is where all the crazy <laughs> Welcome to what happens in Vegas. What happens in Vegas. Actually, you know, we, we, we'll get more. We'll get more into into why are you in Vegas later. Uh, I, I would love to. I don't know how much you can tell, but I would definitely love to hear about that, man. And um, kind of explain a little bit, uh, you know, uh, what got you there after all. Uh, but uh, man, talking about McGregor, it's incredible because this guy, you know, I, I I typically tend to like these athletes that are like over the top to some degree, but they yeah. always deliver. You know, like Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, McGregor. I always like I'm, I fanboy them so hard actually. Uh, and and it's because I think that to some degree, saving distances, of course, I have, I have nothing on those people yet. Um, you know, I've always liked to also shit talk a little bit, and then no, I was gonna say you can you can clearly see that you um, have modeled yourself on that because obviously I remember when you were um, w were a player, and you were like a, a bit of an iconoclast, right? Like you did talk shit on your opponents you were known as kind of the bad boy of league of legends now 
back when you were playing League of Legends was a much different kind of environment to what we have now. It was very much, it was kind of like how Overwatch is, where True. it's like, you know, very almost child centric, I want to say. So to be a bad boy in League of Legends, you didn't have to do much, like, you know, stay out past midnight and say, <laughs> and say shit. That was it. Then you were like the bad boy of, of League, right? But like to be fair, you were one of the more interesting characters. Like I, I remember you were the guy uh, that got me into uh, League in a way. I, I went to an IEM. I can't remember which one it was. I think it was one of the ones at Gamescom, and you were competing there with SK Gaming. And I, I'd always been kind of dismissive of League, but it was clear it was going to be a big thing. But um, I, I started following it, but I didn't really like watching it. I didn't really, I, I couldn't sit down and watch the games and think it was good. But there was this one game, I can't remember who the fuck you were playing against, but you actually did a Baron steal. You actually jumped oh. into the pit and stole Baron with an Oriana, which I think was, was one of your fucking picks. CLG you against Froggen, actually. Yeah. And I, I remember it well, like a fucking crowd, like they erupted. And it was like in that moment for me, the penny dropped and I was like, oh yeah, this is fucking great. And, you know, after the game, I think you guys won and you were there in your scarf and, you know. <laughs> do, oh, man, those interviews. times. You're making me yeah. you're making... kind of, uh, you know, remember those times. That, that's beautiful, man. I got to be honest, man. Sometimes I, I, I do have, you know, dreams at night. And, mm. and in those dreams are typically either about World of Warcraft. I mean, when the dreams I, I, I win competitively are either World of Warcraft or League of Legends. And I, I remember kind of those moments. And in my dream, those moments are vividly recreated. It's mm. fucking crazy, man. Like, I literally can feel what I felt in that exact moment. Like, I could probably just paint. If I, if I would know how to draw, I could paint kind of how everything looked for me, you know? Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, but yeah, man, you know, I, I, I agree with you. Having these kind of um, athletes... Uh, you know that that you look up to. I mean, they shape the way you um, you kind of uh, you know it, you know make people perceive yourself in a way. So mm. uh, you know the, the the more you read about this guy or the more you watch about this guy, you just you become a little bit that person if, if you idolize them a little bit. I, I think it's always easier for people to relate with, right? Because the average person isn't an athlete. The average person doesn't know what it's like to have to sacrifice you know if you're a soccer player you have to sacrifice everything to kind of you know keep your diet right practice 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 training you know playing games on the weekends when all your peer group are out to parties and if, and you're you're doing this to be literally one percent that's the number of that's people true. that go on to be a professional footballer it's it's an immense amount of sacrifice and as a result a lot of people that excel at sports and esports they're socially dysfunctional to a certain degree they don't have a normal social life they don't learn normal social skills so when we see somebody who is a party animal doesn't make those sacrifices they go out they drink you know women they do but they can <laughs> still turn up with a hangover and play better than 99 percent of the people they play against obviously everybody gravitates towards those people they are the relatable bridge between the sacrifice of sports and and everyday normality right so you have them you have them in even like mundane sports you know snooker you know you get your ronnie o'sullivan's um, you know, George Best in, in, in football, I, just throughout the ages. Okay, Conor McGregor could have been that guy. I, I think he's just gone, like, way too far over the yeah, edge. He went like, too over the top, yeah, I agree. Yeah, it reminds me of Tyson, honestly. Um, Ty, you know, I, I grew up watching Mike Tyson fight. I, I, I was devastated when he... Fuck, wait, how old are you? I'm pretty old, dog. Uh, I, 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 I used to watch his fights when I was a kid. And I, I was devastated I remember, when I and Mike went to prison. Um, and, and I, I, I remember watching his comeback fight, uh, when he got out of prison, we got that on pay-per-view on Sky TV in the UK, me and all my friends, we all like chipped in, you know, like two pounds each to get this pay-per-view fight to watch Iron Mike come back, you know? Uh, but, but what, what the, what happened with Mike Tyson was, um, you know, he, he had, uh, a, a trainer who, uh, really, really cared about him. And then when he passed away, there was nobody to sort of that could step up and 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 sort of 
look after Mike the right way, the way he used to. And eventually, you know, this is the best, the greatest boxer of all time. He's better than Ali for me. Um, you know, vintage Mike Tyson would have ripped Ali's head off, I think. Um, okay, and, well, and, that, that, that's another that's another topic of discussion. Yeah. We need another hour and a half. For... <laughs> <laughs> but um, but but you know, he just had he just had a bad entourage around him. People who just wanted to encourage him to react to his base natures you know doing things for money doing things for reputation and status and i see like that's happening with conor mcgregor right now like no one's looking out for conor mcgregor's best interests he's been allowed to like run riot in the ufc and and this is what's going to happen you know it, it it could well end if, if he keeps going the way he's going it's not unthinkable that conor could end up in prison as well so all right no it, it's 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 a sad to see but um, I mean, I, I truly hope he comes back. He pays whatever he has to pay. He goes through whatever many curves he has to go. By the end of the day, you know, whenever he, um, when, whenever he, he fights, uh, you know, Khabib or whatever, I mean, he's just, that shit is going to explode anyway. Yeah. So, you know, sure. UFC, uh, uh, Dana is really crazy right now on it. But at some point, he will just, just, just let it be. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they move themselves by money, by entertainment. He, he crossed the line, but they're probably going to let him be. Yeah, like I said, I think it'll just be financial this time around, but he definitely needs to get better people in his camp and like people that are going to look out for him and, and make sure he doesn't throw away a, what could be an amazing mixed martial art career, you know? I mean, this yep. is a guy like, you know, I, I thought the Mayweather, you know, as somebody, like I say, who, who's boxed, I, I thought the Mayweather fight was a much better spectacle than I was expecting it to be. That was amazing. That was really uh, yeah, good. Yeah, I mean, like, I've seen some legitimate boxing matches, a lot of legitimate boxing matches that are billed as super fights that were absolute garbage on a technical <laughs> level, you know, that were worse than that. So, um, yeah, I, I think I think it would be a shame if McGregor kind of ruined his career with all this like stupid nonsense like fighters should just be about training get in the ring you can go what do your thing have a career you can go wild in your late 30s 40s spend all that crazy money do whatever you want <laughs> you know there's no need to be getting May involved in stuff style. like this yeah exactly right um so you know i was the other day in uh, in the gym and i was listening to a podcast i typically don't listen to podcasts but for that mm. i was listening to one and and uh, the guy i can't remember what, what the name was uh, but he made a really good question uh, to, to, to the guy that was there with him. And he was, tell us a story about a defining moment in your life that made you who you are today. And he got stuck in me and I said, you know, this is a question I actually should probably make on every podcast because it's just fucking glorious. So, yeah. so is, is there any story where you look back, Look at it and say this. This story has defined the way I am today, or or where I am today in general. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's nothing to do with esports. I I've started a pod a podcast of my own recently, like just an audio thing, where it's like I talk about I do like word association about my past for an hour. So it's like I'm talking about memories and things that kind of shaped who I am. And really, the idea I haven't is, seen that. God damn, I have yeah. to check that out. It, 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 it's basically um. Yeah, it's just called. I just called it stream for now because it's like it's about stream of consciousness. So I don't know if that's a very good title. I might change that. But um, yeah, basically, I, 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 th- I think it sucks. With all due respect, I okay, think the title yeah, no sucks. <laughs> yeah, hey, that's fine, dude. Um, I mean, esports uh, with us that shouldn't be too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That's true. That is true. Uh, but you know, we, we we can work on that, right? But I, I wanted to get it down. The idea is that like I'm gonna eventually like kind of like have a a spoken word account of my psyche so i was thinking a lot about this actually because some of the words that come up are like ambition you know people like pe- people suggest words that's the premise and, and one of the words was ambition and stuff so i, I guess like the, there was a defining moment for me as, as a kid um so I, I i i grew up with my father was away in prison um so i, I didn't have a father and i grew up on a very like poor working class you know kind of council estate where it was all about like surnames and and reputations so if you didn't have a a family that was known as a tough family um or if your dad was away in prison doing a bit you, you were basically picked on because they knew you were weak meat like you know after all my dad couldn't come down to the school to fight my battles for me because he was you know in a in a six by six cell or whatever so um so I used to I used to get fucking wrecked all the time by like gangs of, of kids, you know, that, that were associated through familial ties or surnames. I used to get beat up quite a bit. 
uh, and, and bullied a lot. And I was like desperate to sort of get away from that. But I wasn't a big kid. Uh, you know, I wasn't going to be able to sort of stand up to the bully. That fantasy was never going to happen. In the end, kind of what got me away from that was my mother uh, got with a new guy and we moved. Um, so it wasn't like most when most kids talk about m moving as a child, it's like traumatic. You, you lose all your friends. I fucking loved it. I was like, right, I'm not going to get the shit kicked out of me anymore. Um, or so I thought. But then I went to I went to this school, and it was a, a school in a nice area, in a nice neighborhood. And now I was the kid from the poor background with the rich kids. There is always some baggage. Yeah, or, or the richer kids. And people knew my dad was in prison still, because, you know, it comes out very quickly. Like, oh, where, where, you know, where's your dad at? Why have you got a stepdad? Blah, blah. Kids talk, parents talk, teachers talk. Everyone talks. So I ended up getting, like, a different kind of bullying you know, like a, a, a social kind of bullying and being ostracized. And then that segued into uh, getting into fights anyway. And and again, having not been a kid that had fought a lot, um, I, I wasn't really equipped to deal with it. So I sort of used like comedy or trying to like be friends with people, a kind of like, you know, ease up on on getting beat up a lot by by kids and, and whatnot. But then I I started to fill out. Like I got to an age, like I said, around about 13 years old, I just suddenly shot up. Like puberty just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like just boom. I went from being like a skinny little kid um to to being six foot, you know, started to pack on muscle, um, started shaving, like just immediately. Like it was like I went to sleep one night with like a smooth face. Woke up with a fucking mustache and beard. It was like it was ridiculous. It was just like, what the fuck is happening? And it just, it just came on so quick, right? So now I, I started getting involved in sports and I started playing a lot of rugby. And um, I quickly realized from like training that I was actually quite strong for my for my age. That I was I, I was strong. I was good at taking knocks. Um, I, I could I could play rugby and play it well. And I was like, it, it gave me like a lot of self-confidence. And we went away on some school trip to some bullshit, um, you know, I don't know, like seaside resort to learn about industrial Britain or, or whatever it was. And, it was fun. Oh, yeah, classic. Yeah, British history is always a laugh a minute, right? Like, you know, <laughs> it, it, this is the <laughs> machines where thousands of children died to make carpets <laughs> it's like oh, this is awesome yeah thanks can we come here every week please <laughs> so uh so anyway um we went on this school trip and one of the older one of the kids who'd been like bullying me and starting fights with me for years just wouldn't leave me alone he's a piece of shit called neville uh, i i suppose being called neville's a, a punishment of sorts no wonder he was angry but anyway he st tried to start a fight with me and i just snapped i just i thought fuck it i've had enough i've been getting the shit kicked out of me at home um at, at school f for years so i turned around and i just i just paneled him like this this poor kid got years of pent up frustration just it, just on, on the back of uh, on the back of a bus so I, I i had a fight and i won like i i won a fight it was the first time i'd ever fought in any sort of genuine capacity and I, and I and I won I came out on top and there was a few kind of repercussions where some of the some of his friends wanted to test me and try their shit but eventually they realized those days were over and they moved on to somebody else and they left me alone um and I and I and that that for me was a big defining moment not because violence solves anything but it gave me the confidence to say I am not going to take anyone's shit ever again. Like, I'm not doing it. I am I am not here for that. I'm not going to... Like, I, all my childhood I've done it. Now I'm becoming a man, an adult. I'm not going to do that anymore. And the reason I bring this up as why I, I think it's a defining moment in my life is because I think one of the reasons why is you introduce me. I'm like a love-hate figure. People either really like me and, and, and like what I'm about or they really, really dislike me. Is I just won't take shit. I just... I'm not going to do it. Like, I... I I can't. I can't in good conscience do it to myself. If someone says something stupid, I'm going to call it out. If somebody tries to like do something negative to me, I'm going to reciprocate with negativity. But equally, if somebody does something positive, I'll reciprocate with positivity. But yeah, you know, it it, it was it was that moment where I realized that you know what, 
fighting isn't the worst thing that can happen and it can be figuratively like i fight every day on twitter or i fight to get you know a better position in the industry or i fight to have my opinions heard or it can be literal it can be a literal fight where somebody wants to physically oppress you and you say, no, I'm not going to allow that. Um, so, yeah, so, it, you know, it, it helped instill like a fighter's mentality in me. Okay, no, that, that story is, <clears throat> is incredible. And uh, I, have, I have no idea whether you told the story before, actually. Uh, mm. But uh, it, 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 at least for me, it, it explains a lot, you know. Um, mm. a, a lot of the things that you could have doubts about uh, are probably just automatically explained just with this story. Um, so with, with, with that said, mm. you know, it, it seems to me like you at some point uh, looked kind of embraced uh, your attributes, so to say. Uh, and and at which point, uh, or, or rather, let, let me rephrase the question. Which attributes do you think you have in terms of good and bad? Like what, what, what makes up for your character in terms of good and bad? Yeah, I, I think all of my attributes are, are both simultaneously good and bad because, like, they need to be contextually applied. And unfortunately, it, like, they're, they're the kind of attribute that it's there's no either or. Like, I don't turn them on, a, on and off. I can't do that with them. So, you know, for example, I'm incredibly stubborn. Now, stubbornness is great because, you know, when, when you're a, a, a journalist and you need to stubbornly chase down a story, and you need to cut through people's bullshit when everyone's lying to you. <laughs> being stubborn is great. Being stubborn's awesome. When, where being stubborn becomes uh, less of a virtue is, for example, there's a million arguments that I could get out of. You know, there's a million incidents I could get out of if I just wasn't just so... Yeah, but I don't. I just think, me, fuck it. I'm, uh, you know, we, we, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm, this guy until yeah, the I'm end. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna make them. I'm gonna make them understand I'm right. And because of that, you know, you, you get into these situations that can spiral and snowball out of control. But it's for me, it's like I, 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 I'd rather take that bad and be able to do the things I do because I know I'm so resolute and forthright, and I will keep going, and I don't get discouraged, and I don't get disheartened. So stubbornness is is one of them. I think um like I, I I don't have a particularly high tolerance for stupidity and and things that seem uh, like glaringly obvious to me. Um you know, I, I can be very impatient with people if they don't get on board quickly with what is self-evident. You know, like I, I a lot of people on a lot of the reasons why there's any inflammatory content on my Twitter feed is because somebody tweets something at me and goes, well, you said this, and it will be something I didn't you're say racist at all. And you're like, prove it. And then oh, well, yeah, I mean, that's, that stuff's outrageous. Uh, yeah. But yeah, when, when people basically like wrongly attribute something because they can't fucking read, when they tell you, you said something, and you go, no, I didn't say that, and they go, yeah, look, it's here, and you're like, holy shit, you, you legitimately can't read, and yet you're allowed to have a Twitter account. Like, you know, it, 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 bo it bothers me. It bothers, you know, it's like, holy shit, like, you're out there just running amok, lying, with just being utterly stupid, and it's fine, apparently, and it's like, it's my reputation that has to suffer as a result of your stupidity? Fuck that noise. So, yeah, so that that's another thing. Like, I, I think, again, it has its positives, right? Because it's like, no, this is actually what how something is. This is what it means. And again, for what I do from a journalistic perspective... It enables me to break down quite complex threads, you know, like maybe multiple businesses, you know, own things or, you know, whatever. It is. I can break things down quite clearly and easily and show timelines and, and present it in my work in a way people can understand. But the flip side to that coin is that when people come to me and say things that are patently false or ridiculous, I do tend to get, you know, very upset quite quickly with that. I don't tolerate fools very well at all and unfortunately in our industry you're dealing with people who are younger so they're not fully intellectually developed you know i'm sure if i'd met me aged you know 16 i probably would have thought i was on course to be a jerk you know <laughs> it, it it just is what it is but i am who i am now and and it's very hard for me to sort of remember that yeah you are dealing with as I said, people that might not be the best socially people that might not be the smartest people who might be younger and it's 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 hard for me to kind of like keep, you know, 
hold my tongue and be patient and be more understanding of people and and maybe even not attribute like malicious intent to what is stupidity or just being misinformed you know i I do tend to escalate quite quickly on that but again i'm too old and i'm I'm not it's not something i'm going to actively work on improving i i I think there's this sort of attitude now towards personalities which i am for good or ill that i need to be constantly striving to be what the public want you to be they want you to be a virtuous person they want you to embody all of these positive traits meanwhile they set you an impossible standard that they themselves would never be able to live up to or have any uh, yeah have any desire to live up to right because who wants to live their life that way me i i i'm comfortable being a three-dimensional flawed human being like we all are but just putting those flaws out into the public domain what what you see is what you get there's never a persona there's never any bullshit that's just who i am and if you if you don't like it fine you can go and fucking cry about it but i'm not going to change i'm not i'm yeah, not going to well, work on that, that smoothing me. those edges off one of the things that bothers me definitely is now with social media and the fact that everything that you do um, mm. is looked, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy that, it, <clears throat> that everyone can take a picture of you anywhere and anything you say will be forever filed uh, mm. and will never be, I mean, if it's relevant enough, it will never be deleted from, from the web because it, it'll have, you know, everyone will have it on their computer, right? Mm. It's just impossible to delete that kind of information. So you, if you fuck up, that's just going to, hunts you forever okay. and, and and that's why it, it, it actually a little bit bothers me the fact that uh you know there are there are certain topics that i'm not gonna name um uh, that you know many times i'm like man it's just so unfair you know i, w- I wish i could just speak up my mind mm. uh openly but i know i can't because it doesn't matter how well i phrase this i, I phrase this it's got someone somewhere is going to turn it around and make it look as if I was X, Y, Z. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and this actually kind of bothers me because as a person that tends to, just by nature, my nature, I, I just super transparent. I'll just curse in front of a billionaire if I have to just because it's the way I am. You know, I'm not going to just, you know, be someone I'm not. And in social media, it's pretty much the same. Uh, but it, with, with many topics, I just can't do that because of the incredible risk of it being misunderstood by some people that simply has this one job of yeah. looking at your comment, kind of break it down and look at the semantics and somehow understand that what you're saying is this, even though it's not. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, you're in a different position now. I mean, this is the key thing. Um, back when you were a player, it, it, it doesn't really matter so That's much. That's true. It was just me, right? Yeah, exactly. The impact's minimal. Maybe you get dropped from your team, maybe you get fined, but you know, you're a big brand, you're a big player. You'll find somebody else willing to take a, a chance on you, you know? It's just that That's simple. a very good point. When you run a business and you're responsible for feeding and clothing and and paying the salaries of all the people beneath you losing a huge corporate sponsorship over something being misinterpreted or maybe it's not misinterpreted but maybe your opinion just isn't popular this this is the other thing you can you can have an opinion that is in no way controversial but because it isn't popular it's not the opinion you're supposed to have it can cost you you know look what sure. happened with Shania Twain the other day, like, who gives a fuck about Shania Twain? Like, how important is Shania Twain in, in the grand scheme of things? Not really at all. And she did an interview and said, you know, she's Canadian, but she said, had I been American, I would have voted for Donald Trump. Okay? That was all she said. And then there's an uproar about it, and she had to issue a public apology for saying she would have voted for a that, candidate in crazy. a country. Yeah, this is the madness. This is this is where we we... This is the world we live in right now. And I'm sure if you had come out during the last election and said, hey, look at these G2 hats, make America great again, and it's got a picture of NBK on the side or something, <laughs> and you you know, when you were selling them saying it's going to be great, we love Donald Trump and all that, like, there would have been sponsors who just come to you and said, yo, sure. this is out, yeah, this is out. So it's not even worth getting involved in that stuff if, if you want to have a successful business. You have to look at what's popular, look at what's trending, 
and then Bro, basically be speaking, on top of that. You're speaking like this is like deep truth right there because as a result of how people interpret, as a result of how society works today, I've been um, I have been increasingly more focused on the end result of every interaction. In other words, I'm not. As time goes by, I'm more and more focused on uh, what is this gonna get me, right? Um, which is a little bit of a, of a psychopathic way of looking at things, to be honest. Uh, but the truth is that if you don't do that exercise, you may as well fall into that trap that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. you have to, okay, if I answer this fan that is outright wrong, will this trigger a chain of responses that will make the actual topic more relevant than it is? right now should i just let the guy be wrong and have you know with his 12 12 twitter followers the poor guy should i just let him be miserable or should i just say that? right so the, the, these things even though they do bother me there's no way to change them really no i i don't i don't think so either i mean the reality is um social media is uh it's it's a great thing for businesses. It's a great thing for brands, but it comes at a cost, and I and I understand the cost. Like it would be hugely unfair for let's say that that like a brand, any brand has huge social media reach. You could talk directly to your consumers, people that are going to support you financially, your customers. You can gain new customers. You can gain new business. It would be really unfair if there was no downside to that, right? And unfortunately, the downside is every idiot on the internet, every person, be they an idiot or not, but let's just say for the purpose of argument, they're all idiots. They have Twitter accounts, and they feel legitimately connected to these brands, and, and they think their opinion matters in a way that it actually doesn't. Back in my day... If you were upset at something, if you didn't like what a company did, you had to sit down, write them a letter, send them a letter, wait for a reply, and nobody knew about it. It happened nice in a vacuum. Me. The only people who knew were you and the fucking secretary that picked up the letter. That was it. <laughs> true, because yeah. yeah, that they were the only two people who knew about it. Now what happens is, if somebody complains about something because they think they're entitled to complain and they publicly do it. If, if enough people see it and it goes viral and then the media, because they don't want to have to do any work and actually do research and reporting and have and inform people, they just, fuck it, I'll just go on Twitter. What's trending? Top tweet today, you know, company X has done this bad thing according to this tweet. So this tweet goes viral. And then other people start bandwagoning in and saying, we're going to boycott and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And unfortunately, the corporations, the brands, they feel like they've got to acquiesce and give them what they want. So they come out, they release an apology, they change something, they do something. And it creates this cycle of like recreational outrage yep. where people who, without even leaving the house, they've had their little power moment. They've had their little activist moment. That's, that's exactly, that's exactly the key. The key is that they feel important for a second. They feel like they can actually mm. change this, the way things work for yeah. a second. And, and, and that gives them a sense of importance that otherwise they wouldn't have. And yeah, exactly. It, it, it's, it's, like the, it's like the rat pushing the button to get the fucking cheese. And every time you get the cheese, the rat wants to push the button more and more to get more and more fucking cheese because it likes <laughs> cheese. And this is unfortunately yeah. what's happening with social media. More and, and more. That's people... why you go to, to, to this to this guy's twitters, tweet twitters, and mm. the guy that shits on you often, you go into his mentions, and like eighty percent of the mentions are just outright negative. Like, yeah, just they want to whine all the time, shit on anyone, really. Yeah, and it doesn't matter who. This is the other thing. I mean, you'll see people. One minute they'll they'll go for you know this is my stance, this is my politics, this is what I'm about. But then they see an opportunity to get involved in another drama, another moment, another activist thing, and and boom, they'll completely change what they. You know, I've seen this with numerous like accounts where it's like they say one thing one week, they say the exact opposite the next. They just want to ride the wave of being there, of feeling important. And again, people don't even realize, like, you have to be deranged slightly, I think. Like, 
the people who tweet at Donald Trump, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll bring it back to Trump because I think it's always a fascinating example what's happened Is in, 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 in American yeah. politics. Yeah, like they tweet at Donald Trump. He ain't reading your tweets. You're not really talking to the president. You're not important enough to talk to the president. You will never be important enough to talk to the president. Ostensibly, on a geopolitical level, you do not matter. If you think you do, you are deluded. You do not matter. And you can tweet at Trump all day. You know, there's a bunch of people who, they would serially reply to Donald Trump tweets. They would literally set, they would have I've, I've an alarm set on their phone. Same yeah, guys, by the yeah. way. And they yeah, like, oh, when he replies, they, they have them prepared. Like, he posts something, and I see they have them pre I mean, I'm not saying I'm pro or against. I'm just saying that it's hilarious that when someone yeah. just goes up and responds, like, 20 different tweets that are clearly prepared because they are all posted at the same minute. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And 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 they're now trying to sue Donald Trump. They've got a, they've, they've actually got a lawsuit going through because Donald Trump has blocked them, so their replies don't appear in the chain. So it's and, like and, if they, yeah, it's like yeah, if they're, they're saying it's a free speech them. issue. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Well, the, w w all they ever wanted was basically to, you know, b be seen by everybody else. And this, it's just, it, I don't know, it's it's not even about the principles at that point. Because, A, you're not talking to the president. Like, Donald Trump, everyone talks about Donald Trump's Twitter, right? I am sure he dictates his tweets. I don't think a 70-year-old man is sat there bashing out Maybe uh, he do, maybe, I, I disagree there. <laughs> right, well, okay. I disagree there. <laughs> Actually, some of them are so badly spelled. Yeah. Maybe, it, yeah. Maybe, maybe it is him, right? But but the reality is, he then doesn't sit there like me and you would and go, right? Well, let's see what the replies we got here. <laughs> oh, you know, he's not scrolling through the millions of replies like, oh look, fucking. Uh, uh, Margers should kill themselves, says, and then he, you know, he's not taking on board any feedback. He's saying what the fuck, he's the most powerful man in the world. He's saying what the fuck he wants to say in public to suit his agenda, and you can cry about it, but if you're, if you're one of the people who was sat there spamming his Twitter feed, you've got something wrong with you. So, yeah, social media was just such a huge mistake, and unfortunately, I, I think it's driven us all a little bit crazy. I think the way we handle our business, the way we think about brands, the way we think about uh, personalities and celebrities, it's been completely warped through that prism. And unfortunately, it's going to take us a long, long time to get back to normality. And, and, it it and feels to me like we're... there has to be, uh, I, I feel like social media has been overall like net positive. You look at the 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 actual uh, advancements in the world and uh, yeah may look at Amazon, maybe look at, you know spacex like this has been a lot of advancements and social media played a big role there my point is i think everyone should be held accountable for everything they do right mm -hmm. to some degree so in a way i think every every social media account should actually be confirmed like with id and yada 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 i mean there are a few countries that do this i know this uh, is, i think uh, you know, for example, with uh, uh, Riot Games, League of Legends, South Korean account, I think is directly yeah. linked. Like, I think that is actually not a bad thing. I think that at least we'll add some kind of, you know, we'll take away the entitlement and we'll at least make people a little bit more mindful and conscious of what they say and do. It's, it's, it's a real tough one for me because um, I... I... I support anonymity on the internet as a principle, but the, the problem you have is that anonymity on the internet isn't ever being talked about for what, for what it's there for. For example, uh, as a journalist that works with whistleblowers, Obviously, if you're exposing a big company that has the means and the resources to make your life miserable, or if you're exposing a corrupt government that could literally rendition you off the streets and have you killed or imprisoned, anonymity is sacrosanct you've got to be able to say look what's happening in my country this is bad on social media reach people show what's happening without fear of reprisals anything that jeopardizes that is dangerous to the fabric of a healthy society but unfortunately what social media is primarily used for it's not used for whistleblowing. It's not used for exposing corrupt governments. Um, it's used to basically tell people to kill themselves or threaten people or for tell sure. yeah, or tell women they should get raped or all sorts of other heinous stuff. Absolutely. And, yeah. and, 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 and then when people go, actually, I don't like being threatened. I want to know who threatened me so I can report them to the police. Everyone comes out and goes, ah, you're doxing them. You're not respecting their rights as a private citizen. It's like... 
I hate to break it to you. Technically, they are breaking the law. So it, 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 it's, for me, responsibilities and obligations, it's like a two-way street, right? And people who have social media and want to preserve anonymity shouldn't then, just because anonymity is given at the moment as a readily accepted thing, they shouldn't abuse it to basically threaten people and make other people's life a misery. I'm not talking about calling them, you know, like I get every day, ha-ha, you're a fat, bald, old loser or whatever. whatever That's right. fine. See, yeah, whatever. Who gives a fuck? Like, I'm balling out of control. Those motherfuckers have to get up in the morning <laughs> and work a job they fucking hate. Right? Like, so you have at it. If it makes you feel better, do that. That, right like I, it's fine but when you start like threatening me and i had a ton of threats lately like people literally saying i will come to this event that you are at and i will shoot you that for me is where it's like i don't i don't That's give a fuck about your yeah i don't care about your anonymity at that point i'm gonna report you to the feds and i hope they pay you a visit sorry <laughs> that's that's kind of how I feel about that. You know it, it seems to me that it's just it's a really good point actually but it, it seems to me that um you know what I just suggested about no one really being anonymous uh, is probably like a patch to the real mm -hmm. problem, right? It seems to me that the real problem is actually education. The whole education system is just completely fucked up. The fact that you need to learn the the names of the rivers and mm -hmm. the branches of the fucking rivers before you get to learn consciousness, before you get to learn empathy, before you learn you get to learn what I consider the foundation, like the mm. basics of how to live a fulfilling life that creates value for others, I think that's the real problem, right? So mm. I, I, I think I, I, I've, I've read in Twitter Thorin actually speak about this uh, a few times, actually, and I think he has, he has a really good point. It, it seems to me that philosophy in general should be taught much more than the fucking river names like come on yeah. like who cares about that i i don't remember half the spanish river names and and i'm glad to be honest like i don't i i wish i could just remove from my brain those i remember because it's a fucking waste yeah i mean i've said this before as well like the educational system it's really interesting that if you look at the curriculum in the UK, the curriculum is sort of based on the ancient Greek ideal, which is that you learn the building blocks of knowledge um, and, and a fundamental foundation and the basics, and then you go on and specialize. And we teach it modularly. And this is all, this is all, again, this is all from classical Greek, you know, teaching. This is how they used to learn things. So, it's incredible to me that you would copy this uh, system, which is considered to have emanated from the peak of the Western world. You know, the, the civilization that everybody looks up to and is still discussed uh, to this very day for that reason. And yet they miss out the core. And that was that the first thing everybody learned was philosophy. Philosophy literally meaning the love of knowledge. Um you you would you would basically learn like this is why learning is great this is why we do things this is why we question everything you would have you know back and forth rhetorical arguments yep. they would they would do exercises where you would be given an opinion that you do not believe in and you would have to present it as if you did to somebody who did believe in it but they would be arguing against it so people were very cognizant of both sides of an argument you would do all of this before you even sat down and learned mathematics or yep. any you know any of the other stuff and it's like we just don't do that in the UK it's like hit right you must learn a language and people are getting fat so you must do pe and um you, you math maths and english are absolutely essential like, straight up, I don't give a fuck about mathematics. I know maths is important, right? But I'm not a numbers guy. Never have been. I can't remember none of it. It didn't stay in my brain. It's not important to me. I've got a calculator. That'll do me. I can probably just about do basic arithmetic. I was always a words guy. Now, I passed my exams. I, you know, I got like a B or whatever, to because you have to have that. If you get less than a C, you know, there's loads of jobs you can't have in the UK. But, you know, for me... I would have much rather have dedicated, like, because I hated it then, and I hated it, I hate it now, and I'm never going to suddenly sit down and decide, yeah, I might learn maths, actually. It's never going to be part of my life. I would have loved if there was a way that I could have had that time and filled it with something else that I 
was interested in by the time I went to college and university. But instead, it's just this like scattershot approach. Like we'll give you a, a little bit of everything. And then when you go to college, you can specialize a little bit. And then we expect 18 year olds with this like smattering of all different kinds of knowledge to know what they want to specialize in for the next three years of their life. Yep. It, it, it's nonsense. It's a non you know, that, it really what, is a nonsense. What's nonsensical system. for me is that, uh, you know, after all, you know, I, let, let's actually look back when I was actually just going to, to school, high school, etc. And I remember I hated, I truly just hated everything but mathematics just because I just liked mathematics. I happened to like mathematics, right? Um, uh, I didn't enjoy really to study it, but I just didn't hate it at least. I, I, could, I could swallow it. I don't know if you can say that. But, uh, yeah. Um, but I could see that there was no reason for me uh, to, to, to study many of the things I studied. I was just pretty much forced to it, right? And, and what I've come to realize um, at some point in my life, especially the moment I, I read a book called Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, right? Yeah, I know it. Yeah. And so that book, like, I was fucking blown away. I was like, okay, so... This is this is when my school starts. Like I'm, I, I, I was feeling so energized because at that moment I realized what learning means and what school should have been about. That school, school should have been about me looking forward to go to class every day to learn what else can help me in my life or to learn how to have more fun in this area of my. You know, just learn how to live a more fulfilling life as opposed to just. Uh, how do you call them? Um, um, uh, things without substance that mm -hmm. are not going to shape the way I live whatsoever, right? Um, and yeah, you can specialize and become a surgeon for which you will need a lot of specific knowledge. And when you have you know, the age to be able to choose that career path, then so be it if you love it. Why not, right? But many of the things, the vast majority of the things we, we, we learn in school, or well, learn, uh, you know, uh, mm. try to educate ourselves in school, end up being completely worthless. And many of the things are even obvious, like some of these mathematics, right? You want to understand logic, but you don't need to understand, you don't need to know how to multiply very complex kind of, uh, uh, you know, formulas or anything mm. like that, because today you have the calculator, right? And you have like a lot of tools that allow you to do all these things effortlessly. Uh, so it definitely, it looks to me, and you know, coming back to the topic, that education it, itself needs um, to be reshaped and rethought about. It's complicated because there's a lot of old dogs, a lot of 60 yeah. plus years of age that are just, you know, too much in their old ways. And it's really hard to change things. But it seems to me like it's a matter of time until education does change. By the way, keep in mind, mm. the current education system is based upon um, the times in which factories were, you know, pretty much where you were going to end up 80% chance, right? Or 90% yeah. chance. Well, we, we actually had a system in the UK that we got rid of uh, uh, called the tripartite system, which basically was, depending on your social class, you got put into a school. I, I was not old enough, fortunately, to have gone through this. But you basically went to you know, a, a school that if you were if you were very well educated, you know, and, uh, for, or from an affluent background, usually the latter, not so much the former. Very rare people could get scholarships. You went to a private school, and this was about you know education and the arts and politics, and that's why we have this trend in the UK where all of our like ruling class is you know Etonians and people that went to private you know very big popular private schools and went on to Oxford and Cambridge because for years that was the the only path that was mapped out for people like that. Then you had schools that would teach you, like you say, practical stuff like woodwork, uh, grammar schools, you know? They would teach you woodwork and, and trades because you were never going to aspire to be anything else. You didn't need to know philosophy or English literature or anything like that. You, you were literally going to be a tradesman. Yep. And, 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 and that's what they did. And they literally, we literally had a, a three-tiered educational system in the UK that was based on, well, you, your parents made this much money, so we think this is where you belong. Honestly, I, we're, we're, we're not that much further forward now uh, in British education. I mean, yeah. I, I can't speak for the rest of Europe, 
But yeah, we're I mean, um, I, I think you should for poor. the most part. I mean, except in Nordic countries where it seems to me like things are slightly more advanced. Europe uh, maybe is slightly better uh, than in the US, but it's still, I think it's still, you know, really bad uh, in comparison yeah. to where it should be. Um, well, this is actually this is actually a super super interesting topic. Coming coming into this this you know I just have a lot of follow up questions as we speak. Yeah, and sure. by the way, if if, if we want to have a break for some water or toilet or whatever, you you let me know and we have a break anytime. Eh? It is, oh yeah, don't, don't don't you worry. I'm I'm I talk for a living, so I'm, I'm I've got a lot of stamina <laughs> for that kind of thing. I love it. Um, what do you think about the fact? This is an actual fact. Um, you know, factory work is more and more uh, taken care of by. Uh, AI robots, and mm. uh, you know, a, a, a lot of a lot of uh, what we do today is going to take care of my machines. Um, uh, you know, not not we're not too far from that. Ten, fifteen years from now, uh, the, I, I read an article not too long ago, and there'll be fifteen to twenty percent less jobs for the people, right? Yeah. Uh, and and that's actually quite uh, scary from a social. Like, I don't think we're ready for that. How do you think? Uh, this will all end up in because I have my own theory, which is kind of crazy to be honest. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to share with you later, but I want to kind of pick your thoughts. Where is this all ending? And you don't have to again uh, get too deep into politics, whatever you think. I just want to. No, I, I, I'm always happy to. I, I wear my <laughs> politics on on my sleeve. Uh, like for me, I, I've always said this. I, I think with the I, uh, idea of like futurism and ro robotics coming in and autom automization kind of taking away a lot of factory jobs. Obviously, on the surface, there's a lot of concern. But it, in, a, in an ideal futuristic society, humans should not be doing those jobs. They, they never should. They weren't fit for purpose. If you go back and look at your history of the Industrial Revolution, which, as you know from the earlier question, I certainly had to study at school, uh, they, they, these were horrible. Not just soul-crushing jobs, not like just working in a call center or an office job you don't like. Literally body-mangling, horrific, physical jobs. All of my family were miners. I watched my uncles and my great-uncles and my grandparents. I watched them rot away from black lung, you know, pneumoconiosis. I watched them have, you know, the pneumatic drill finger where, inexp you know, from using the drill... Their finger would go hard, white, it would have no circulation, it would eventually have to be amputated. All these horrific industrial diseases from working down the pit. Um, and, and they paid compensation out to, to, to miners. You had to be smart enough to know how to get it, and it was a derisory small amount for the conditions they put themselves through. But if you'd, if you'd have said to any of those miners, hey, we're going to get machines to do your jobs, they would say, oh, my God, no, because then I won't have a job. They would feel emasculated. They would feel, that, well, how am I going to provide for my family? What happens now? They should never have been in a deep hole in the ground breathing in toxic fumes, but it's better than no job at all. How else will I make a living? And that was one of the problems with mining communities when the mines closed down. There was nothing else for these people to do. They had to go away and retrain or go on to what's called the dole, you know, the benefit mm -hmm. system. Now... So, so this is the problem you've got. It's the transitional element. It's where do you put the people right. while we establish this new futuristic society? Yeah, yeah. Or of course, the, 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 ideal scenario, the ideal scenario yeah. is that these people will learn over time other kind of skills that will allow them to be, I don't know, actors or kind of artists in general or kind of different job, right? But that is that happens over time. That, again, is an educational kind of uh, barrier here what happens with those people that actually lose the job at that moment in time yeah. what do you do with them and then you have and th there here is where i have um how, how do you call this um i have a conundrum right mm. which is so on one side you want to have only jobs that create value that's what a job is you create value for the advancement of the world and humanity right uh, but what happens if your job does not generate value, but it exists only for the purpose of you artificially being able to exist and feel artificially useful? 
Mm. Um, an example of this could be, you know, when, when, when Trump, and I don't, I don't want to get into politics again, but mm. when Trump said about, you know, these coal jobs, for example, right? Mm. The world is undeniably moving towards other source of energy. So when you artificially boost the number of coal jobs, that may actually not be valuable for humanity as a whole. It oh, may yeah, give yeah, those definitely. people a fucking job. That's yeah, it. Yeah. But it, now I have a conundrum. What is the right thing to do? Because those people need a job. On the other hand, those people are actually not helping humanity advance. So, it, look. So th this is this is any shift in technology, any shift in culture, any shift in society. There's always, like I say, a transitional element where the old is kind of pushed into a cul-de-sac, while the new comes through, and we establish. How, how it's going to work moving forward. And again, unfortunately, there's no way to eradicate obsolescence. It, there's, and, and you can be clinical about it when it's machines. Uh, we don't feel bad when... We didn't feel bad when cars replaced horses. Um, we're not going to feel bad when the electric supercar that spits water out the back instead of carbon emissions... Uh, is going to replace our old petrol cars. We're not going to feel bad about the obsolescence of technology. We don't feel bad that our new shiny NVIDIA 1080 Ti's has replaced our old fucking, you know, Radeon, whatever the fuck we used to have. Technology is fine. Obsolescence of technology is fine. The problem is obsolescence, ob obsolescence of trades and obsolescence of people. What do you do with that? What do you do when you literally say to somebody who's worked a job for 30 years, your job doesn't exist anymore, <laughs> and you're too old to even, it's not even really worth you learning anything else important. So now you must go and do an unskilled job, making ends meet, no job security. We're literally just going to find somewhere to put you until you die or retire. You know, it, it, it's not very nice. It, it's, it's not, not a pleasant nice. thought. And this is, why, this is why people are like, no, we need jobs. We must create right. jobs. Uh, because we, we, we as, a, as a culture, we have interwoven the importance of job with identity, with purpose. So that's what we have to do. You must have right. a job. Unfortunately, so, what, what, what I, uh, Bill Gates made a suggestion. I, I know what he's talking about. Yeah, I think, I think this would make more sense to me. So what Bill Gates wanted to do was he wanted to um, have companies that, uh, like Amazon, for example, who were having a big push on automation, you know, drones that deliver Pay a things, tax for the automation itself. Yeah, so they, he wants those companies to pay a bigger tax to basically slow down the rate of innovation slightly while we go through this transitional period, slow down the rate of automation. And I think if you were to agree to that and then have some of that money go into, you know, schemes where it's like, you know, they supplement the income of the affected industries like the miners, you know, things like that, that's going to help. But ultimately, there is no easy answer. The bottom line is, as technology shifts, some people are going to get left behind. If you specialized in an industry that no longer exists, sorry, you know, it's cold, it's callous, but... That is the way the cookie crumbles, and I yeah. don't think the human progress can be put on hold because we don't want people who work in an right. outdated industry to feel that they've lost their sense of purpose. I can still have empathy for the individual, but it's probably a bad decision for a society, yeah. honestly. It, it, it does feel to me that um, the fact that these people have been a big part of the progress of humanity itself, the fact that we right now have to, in a way, take care of them, which is in a way, kind of socialism, right? Um, it's it's not uh, you know a bad thought to me uh, from a from a kind of general point of view, right? Uh, let, let, let let me explain. So it seems to me that whenever there is a moment in which these people stop being useful for humanity, so to say, um, we as a race, so to say, got into this position thanks to how conscious we are about each other, the fact that we are empathetic, right? We mm -hmm. care about each other. Uh, and that um, would probably be a, a bad thing for us. It would probably be our, de our demise, how do you say it? Our, our, yeah, our end? Demise, yeah. Yeah, yeah, our demise. If we have to take care of so many people that on paper are not valuable to us, but we are humans. We are not, we are not lions, right? 
that mm. they will just let the old guy they will just kick him from from the group and he will die alone that's not what we do right so in a way we do have a responsibility for these people that no longer have a job because they got us to some degree to where we are today right yeah exactly so there is a there is a world in which um again not everything is black or white it's probably somewhere in the middle there's a world in which taking care of these people is the right thing to do actually uh, which goes against many of uh, today's uh, political agendas in many countries right hmm. I mean, so, it's some, it's something that's actually quite important to the esports industry, whether we whether we know it or not. Because one of the reasons why you'll find a lot of companies that operate in the esports space uh, are, are based in certain countries is like labor laws, right? And it's like one of the things that always stuck with me is that people always talk about ethics and the importance of ethics, but their sort of corporate and capitalist sensibilities never really align if you analyze it too close. You know, like all the people who are saying, you know, crush capitalism, socialism is the way forward, <laughs> and they're tweeting uh, from their brand new iPhone 10. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that which was made in a fucking fun. sweatshop where people <laughs> literally throw themselves it is out true. of windows than do the work, but then... The, the the company that owns the factory has put safety nets outside the windows so these people can't even die they just get sent <laughs> back to work like that's true that actually happens that's not even a joke that's a legitimate thing people were killing themselves Jesus in these Christ. apple sweat yeah are you for real Steve. yeah this is honestly you could google this Jeez. this is why when everyone was like oh, apple man it, they're such a good company steve jobs is such a visionary motherfuckers that were assembling ipods and iphones were throwing themselves out of windows because the work was just so heinous and it would be in work for hours so rather than look at working conditions they put safety nets outside the windows to stop people oh, killing themselves that's that was the, brutal, bro. yeah that's actually true um so you know it, it, these these sensibilities and and again in, in esports there's companies that manufacture esports products peripherals in uh, that that you in countries that have child labor laws of course there is you know we we just we just it's all la 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 la, la it's all okay it's all okay so you know we're we're a complicated species carlos like we 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 <laughs> we, we, we we aspire to greatness but we're as long as it suits us, we're happy to turn a blind eye to it's a lot true. of it's pure hypocrisy. Shit. Yeah. Pure hypocrisy. All right. Well, honestly, I, I, I like I told you before, man. I told you on Twitter uh, when I when I contacted you for the for the purpose of this of this podcast. I had no fucking idea where we we're headed in our conversation. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad it's heading this way. I'm I'm loving it. I'm loving every second. But I, but I, I do have some uh, some kind of questions, perhaps uh, more. Around esports, because at the end, yeah, yeah, I'll talk I, esports. So I, I'd I'll love work to. in it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So um, you know, I, ha I have a, I have a question that I, I read, you know, in in a few places, and and I, I thought it I thought it was a good question overall, which is if you could go back in time, where would you go and what would you change, uh, as in the context of your esports career. Um, you know, is there something you don't feel like feel fully proud about mm. that you've done? And if so, what it is and, and, and why you did what you did and why you now think differently. Hmm. Tough one, yeah. uh, because I, I need to think about in terms of actual impact. Um, but I also need to think about in terms of principle. So I always joke to people about, oh, you know, I, I should have gone back and took a lot of the money I've been offered down the years, like from shady companies, you know. Like I've, I've had companies offer me money. By the way, wait, wait, I have to stop you here. Yeah. When I see Mo driving the R8, I just, I, I, I don't even know what, I don't, I'm just looking at it, and I'm like, motherfucker, he, I don't even know what, that, <laughs> like, I, I, don't, I don't even know how to react to that. He's just driving well, that thing. I'm like, that's 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 probably on the back of of the 14 year olds that were watching. You you can afford an R8, Carlos. Surely. I'm not talking about me. I didn't. I did not. Put... <laughs> there we go. I like it. I like it. Deflect good. Yeah, good deflect. Like you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like real I, I, talk. I'll just, I I look back in my career mm. and I have not left a single corpse behind. And if for some reason yeah. I kind of uh, fucked up, I fixed that. Um, I fixed that behind the scenes 
Yeah, uh, so. I, I think with, I think with Mo, since we mentioned him specifically, I've I've known Mo for a long time, a uh, really long time, back when he was one of the best players in the world at Counter Strike. So that's how far back it is. Um, and me and Mo have always got along, always. Um, I don't agree with a lot of the stuff he does, but his motivations make total sense. He's not a hypocrite about it. it it's just greed. He just wants to make as much money as possible and have as good a life as possible. And a lot of what he cares about is financially based. So he's never been... Like, if you look into Mo for, like, I mean, ethical Lord, guidance... Let, let, you know, probably yeah. Mo, he, he's done, Mo has done more stuff, okay? Uh, I, I say, uh, that's the same reason I didn't mention the face guys. Because the face yeah. guys actually are talented content creators, at the very least. Uh, same sure. goes for Mo, right? Now let's look at Phantom Lord and what he, mm. you know, what he literally built his uh, his success on, and and it, this is just again, I understand, you know, when when levels of integrity are here or here, I understand that you know everyone's moral compass is, is its own, uh, but uh, there's there's a line you just don't fucking cross, Agreed. and 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 that's the line many of these guys cross. I remember. Right at the very beginning of this whole skin uh, mm. stuff, I remember I had a really good opportunity. Like I'm telling you, I had this uh, head developer, oh, and I had developer, I'm sure. bro. Like it was, it was insane. With like 20k investment, we could have, I could have owned the biggest skin site ever. And and again, I there's no one I know, and I'm telling you this for certain. There's no one I know as greedy with money as. As I am, okay. I'm gonna be absolutely honest here. I love, I love money. I love yeah. everything about money, but there, are, it's all about the moral compass. Like, what do you build the money with? Can you sleep at night? And mm. some of these people either have no fucking soul or they just can't sleep at night. Mm. So I do have a problem with that. No, no, I don't blame you. I, I I'll do be have honest. Competitive advantage over me, uh, just because they're they have no integrity. Simple. Yeah, I mean, I'll be, I'll be honest. Um, I kind of felt sorry for Phantom Lord for James, honestly. Um, I I what I because there's somebody who'd like talked to him a few times, met him in person. Um, somebody who'd covered like a lot of his antics. You have to understand that Phantom Lord really blew up as a streamer. Um, you know, he went from being something bigger than just a League of Legends streamer, and he had a lot of opportunities. And I watched him clearly get um, addicted, for want of a better word, to to making money. A lot of people said, oh, he was addicted to gambling. I mean, that's not true. Because people who were gambling addicts, I mean, the nature of gambling is they you typically lose, lose, lose money. You yeah. Win. yeah, they typically lose money. What, what, what James was addicted to was making money. He always had to feel that he was, you know, making this big nest egg for himself. When he moved out of streaming, he would have this huge amount of money. I don't know where it comes from. Some of his friends have said to me he's always felt a little bit insecure because his partner at the time came from a wealthy family. Um, I don't know if that's true. That's what I've been told. It's not my place to speculate as to the reasons. But I do know that the James that I met initially was actually a cool guy like he was a, he was a nice oh, sure dude. i mean uh, the, yeah, honestly I, I i i don't i don't judge his character i think he's fucking hilarious i laugh my ass off but and i think he's, like, he can probably be a, a great guy i'm not talking yeah. about that you know i'm, I'm talking about they're just it, it's it's i love to compete okay and i love mm -hmm. to compete under the same rules mm -hmm. when there is one guy having competitive advantage over me because Obviously, what he's doing is um, is is beyond. I mean, what, what's legal yeah, and what should be that, done yeah. and unethical, right? Mm -hmm. Then I do have a problem because this yeah, competition, the, the the field is uneven all of a sudden, and I don't enjoy that. So no, I'm glad no, he's gone. Would. Yeah, I mean, look, I, same. I, I I think, but but I think it's a sad story, in 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 a way. It, it it's one of those stories I think people should look at and think about you know what can happen like i know I'm, i mean i'm named in a lawsuit um he's currently suing twitch i don't know if he's going to try and sue me afterwards i guess we'll find out I, I i've already said i strongly advise he doesn't um but why would he um, sue you uh well because i i think in in the lawsuit 
for Twitch, he that his legal counsel, um, despite getting several factual errors wrong, uh, they make several factual errors about me and the nature of the report. But they also try and intimate that it, it, it's false, um, that the st the report was a lie. Um, but then they also admit that the Skype logs were illegally obtained. So they admit that the Skype logs were genuine. So. It's a bit of a mess. I don't think his legal counsel have done him any favors, but he's trying to sue Twitch to get some compensation, basically, for a ban that he considers to be a contractual breach. If Twitch mm -hmm. had breached contract, then yeah, they should absolutely be held up to that legal standard and pay what they owe. I have no issue with it. But what I do know is he won't ever be back on Twitch, and his brand has certainly suffered the past two years because of actions he's made. Uh, you know, he he's taken. So I, I think, all things told, I, I think like. He's a really good example of what can happen if you do take your eye off what's important, which is community building, right. um, standing for people something. that care about you. Yeah, exactly. And and um, yeah, you say for me it was it's it, it's it's a sad story. Now with Mo, Mo's a completely different beast. Mo has done all that shady shit, and he's just publicly said, "Yeah, I did that shady shit. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? I don't give a fuck." You know, like this is me. Like this is what I. So it's like I say, I I can almost respect the clinical nature of it. Mo doesn't care about anything except making that money, and he's got other businesses and other interests and other investments. He jumped straight on the cryptocurrency bullshit when that came out. That's the next mm -hmm. big wave of scams. Everyone's mm -hmm. gonna have an ICO. Everyone's gonna have their own coin, and they're all gonna be honestly super valuable. Give us your money today. And the esports community sort of, I don't know, like the esports community is a little bit of um, a beaten partner in, in a way. They consistently go back for the abuse and they let these people abuse them, which is why I always took it upon myself to try and protect them from their own, protect themselves from their own stupidity, going all the way back to before even StarCraft Two came out. So yeah, I, I agree with you, I, but the the whole skins thing. That should be investigated as a criminal conspiracy. Sure. That is, a, that is a massive criminal conspiracy. I keep telling this. These people who owned all of the skin sites had a meeting. I think it was in Vegas. Uh, they had a meeting where they all met up and they all like taught each other how to make shell companies and how to cover their tracks. And they all agreed to like not you know, piss on each other's fucking, you know, parade and get in each other's way and, and where to register and all this. And, and, the the biggest one that always got away with it was OP Skins. OP Skins was the the gateway that enabled all of these people to cash out. Uh, in, in, and they took a huge percentage for providing that service. Yep. So I, I, as soon as I started looking into it, because I was never against any of it. I was never against the gambling, never against the skins. It was Scoots that made me start to question how bad how bad it actually it is. And then when I started looking into it, I was like, fucking hell, these guys are like legit. This is like organized crime. This is unreal. So, yeah, it, the whole thing was the whole skin stuff was terrible. So getting back to the question, I, I never I, I, I don't regret not getting involved in. I don't like I definitely no, same, don't. Same here, but, same but, here. but 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 I, but I could have made a fortune. Yeah. I had people coming to me saying, hey, Richard, you know, you're Mr. Integrity. Do you want to promote this site? And I was like, well, no, because then that's me selling all my integrity. Yep. And they were like, but you're going to make this money. It's, you know, six yeah, bro, figures. Got, yeah, it, it's been 13 years since I started here. And I think you, you probably are around, around the same amount of time. And, and, like, it's incredible how much credibility pays out over time. And it just it just compounds, right? Like right now, we'll be close in partnerships because they know for a fact, like they just know for a fact that we will not sell our integrity to anyone for anything. Yeah. And, and, and that has, this is, that's just invaluable, right? You can get away, you can, you can earn 10 million, whatever, man, whatever, you know, good for you. But, you know, it's not, those 10 million, you know, are just probably a one-time thing and then you're going to be miserable in terms of relationships, in terms of overall perception of your brand even. Mm. It just doesn't make sense um, to, to, to sacrifice that credibility built over the years. So from own experience, yeah. just keep that, keep, keep that credibility. That's what carries you forward. And that's, you know, that's just your gentleman's world, word, so you say, so to say. Yeah, well, I, I think principles are important and not enough people sort of put stock in it. I think, I think the worst thing that happened to esports really was that people discovered it and then they realized it was a conduit, a gateway to making money. And they started treating, there's a lot of people involved in esports now who were treating it 
as just a way to line their pockets. They're not interested in contributing anything to the space. That's, they just want to they want to get in. Yeah. Yeah. Do a quick asset flip. Get out. And it doesn't really help anyone. Um, I'm conscious that I didn't answer the question. So the thing I regret. Uh, the thing that's had a big impact, like obviously a lot of people will bring up the Lotus stuff again. I still maintain to this day, if somebody tries to like attack you, if somebody's even intimating that they're going to attack you and they invade your personal space, I think you're perfectly entitled uh, to defend yourself. So sure, I, I regret it to a certain degree, but I don't know if I would go back in time and, and change it. Like, if I had the time travel ability, it wouldn't be for that. Um, I think... Maybe the League of Legends subreddit drama could be something that I would definitely look at again. Not because I think the moderators are worth respect. I think they're absolute scum for what for what they did. I think all of them. Again, this is the this is when people get to abuse anonymity. Like the biggest trolls on Reddit are the people who moderate the site. Uh, they're the people who get away with the most. They're the people that can treat you any way they want um, without any repercussions. And these people basically used the fact that they had heightened privileges on a hugely popular website to try and bully me into agreeing to change my work the way they wanted and um, so, you know, so behave off Reddit ways they wanted. You know, the, the moderators on Reddit were basically deleting my content because of things I tweeted. Twitter, Reddit two separate worlds and unfortunately these egotists could never stay in their lane because they don't have anything else like if you if you knew the moderators like i knew the moderators you know like if you've seen the pictures of these people like it's like oh god no no wonder no wonder you're over invested it's really sad you know like you you see they're like you know oh like they've got nicknames and they're all like called awkward this and it's like oh it's it's, it's like the stereotype of what an internet moderator was but the, what I would do, how I would handle it differently is I would, I would probably have just given them their little power trip because that definitely set me back in a way that's like unacceptable uh, to me. Like, for example, you know, Thorin's channel is bigger than mine and it's not a competition, but he has way more subscribers than me on YouTube because he was allowed to have his content on the League of Legends subreddit um, and that helped him grow when League of Legends grew. I was denied that because of these, you know, nameless losers. Um, I My Twitter feed didn't grow as fast as his for the same reason. All of my content was kind of stifled off. Now, it didn't affect me in career terms. I still got to be on American national television. I've still got a wicked uh, job now. Um, I'm still making a lot of money. I still am pretty autonomous. I get to make the content I want to make. So it hasn't hurt my career in that sense, but it did limit my audience. And my audience is like the most important thing to me. So if I had to give these fucking losers like a little dick stroke and pretend they were important and not get into that thing I talked about earlier where it was like stubborn fight, I'm not going to lose I will outlast you. That's how I approach everything. So I, I would probably have gone back in time and not uh, been as combative. Because that whole situation, the way it escalated with them lying about how I drove a Redditor to suicide, and then I got doxxed, and then I had people threatening to kill me and rape my girlfriend to the point where I had to leave my house, that cost me a, a relationship effectively as well. So that whole situation snowballed out of control. The moderators never got any repercussions out of it they all pretend they were doxxed they weren't they all pretend they were harassed they weren't you know it was me who suffered ultimately so i probably would have gone back in time and given these pathetic specimens their little moment and you know changed the the headlines of my work to what they wanted it to be and oh yeah thank you for your guidance so wise league of legends moderators because my youtube channel will be twice as big my twitter would be twice as big you know, it probably just wasn't worth the headache, all things told. All right. No, this is a very good explanation. Um, you seem to be like someone really empathetic uh, by default. Mm. But the way you, uh, you, you know, the, the way you portray your reaction, actually, is, it, you know, tends to be kind of like a kind of resistance, you know? Uh, like, mm. you know, you, I understand your point of view, but fuck you anyway, right? And, yeah. you know, it, it, it seems to me that, that, you know, and, you know, you're so empathetic, really, and it really does seem like it. That you can probably just take a chill pill in those moments, and you know, yeah, you're not you hurt know, yourself, and you're gonna, you understand that his life is probably 
not the greatest. Uh, that's I mean, you mentioned this, uh, and and to some degree, I do agree with you. And um, this is the only thing he has. So mm. he has a power trip, and that's not necessarily you know a bad thing. Just let him have it, and and you probably will benefit a lot from it as well. So again, it's a little bit of a sociopathic way of looking at it. No, it's true. Yeah. It's, it's true. It's a win-win, right? The, the guys yeah, are gonna it, feel better. You're true. gonna feel better. Yeah, right. I could have, I could have definitely handled that like a, a a lot differently. Like I say, you know, it's like it's like short term sufferance for long term gain. And because I'm so like mired in principles, my my whole like fo core philosophy, my my main thing in my personality is do not yield. Never let them. You know, they'll never win. They'll never have me. You know, it's like when I visited my um dad in prison. Uh, what's what? Hang on, I gotta get this. What is the Latin? Uh, I'll get it. The Latin word for something? Yeah, there's, he told me this phrase. Uh, is it is it this? Uh, uh, nolite te bastardus carborundum or something? Listen, I don't, I don't, I don't know what the fuck you just said, but I'm, <laughs> I'm yeah. completely out of this conversation. Right, I have right. no fucking idea. No, you're... sorry, it's wrong. It's illegitimate non carborundum. And my 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 dad told me that when All when right. I was very young and visited him in prison. Um, and he taught he, he my my dad was crazy. He did like in in the few, handful of times I met him, he did do some influential shit. Uh, and that was one of them. And it was like he I asked him what it was like to be in prison, and he said, "Oh, you know, illegitimate non uh, carborundum, which is don't let the bastards grind you down." Okay. Um, it, it's sort of a, a pig Latin like bastardization of that. So it's don't let them. And he, you know, that's how I approach everything. Like you just don't let people grind you down. They try, but you just you just outlast them. You push back. You grind them down. Let's see who snaps first. Mm -hmm. You know, I guarantee it. Like you know, fucking. Uh, like I say, you just outlast your opponent and you win. That's all you have to do. You just have to be mentally strong enough to be like, I am in for the long haul. Every day you wake up and you think you're gonna fuck with me, wrong. I'm fucking with you, right? <laughs> Let's see who breaks first, right? Let's, uh, you know, I, I've got the platform. I'll fuck with you. I'll be out there every day talking about your shit, digging into your shit. Do you want that? Can you cope with that? You, you know, let, let's go. Like Let, a game as well, right? Like kind of a yeah. com little competition right there, right? Yeah, you make it a competition. I, um, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't play games to like in esports to a high competitive level i was a little bit too old to do that my game has always been i will battle with the bastards like i will do it like i will go head to head with you and you will you know i i've got a pretty good track record i expose the scumbags i get them to leave i get people to come out and admit they were wrong i get people to walk back you know terrible things they've done and that whole reddit situation was like just another game to me in the sense that it, what they were doing was completely outrageous. Being the moderator of an independent website does not give you editorial input into a journalist's work. I cannot imagine a world where you would be so fucked up mentally to think that you're entitled to do that. But if I just said, oh yeah, that's a much better suggestion for a headline. Or oh please, if you uh, you know if you like if you give me some input on my work, tell me how I can make it better. If I just lied to them a little bit, None of that shit would have happened, and I'd have been much better off financially, had a much bigger audience now. So sure, I, I won in the sense I didn't bend the knee, and they, I'm sure they are all miserable. Like every but by day winning, I, you lost. Yeah. yeah, exactly, right? Every day I tweeted something about them, and there would be threads made yeah, on the League yeah. of Legends subreddit, like, when are we going to unban Richard Lewis? When I published the stories that they got Teemo hats, and now everybody knows, yes, Riot did influence the subreddit. Like, they hate that. They hated their lives in that moment. They hated having to stay up all day to delete posts from people who were angry at my ban. They fucking hated it. And good. I'm glad they hated it. It's a fraction of how stressful they made my life because their shit doesn't matter. It's of no consequence. You know, it's voluntary. They can walk away, it doesn't cost them anything. So I, I loved that. I was like, yeah, this is the game, all right? You fuck with me, I fuck with you. Let's see who can keep going the longest. So, yeah. Well, man. It, it, you know, it, it, a, a negative mindset, but you're right. You have to have a degree of empathy to be that fucked up about it, I suppose. So that's, that's the past. Uh, there's, there's, you know, like in every, like in every career, right? Uh, you, mm. you have those moments. Uh, and, and for you... Um, you, you, you've you've gone through a lot of bad, but you also you've also gone through a lot of good. Uh, you know, just 
recently you've been uh, becoming more and more a prominent host and yep. in, in esports events. And and I gotta tell you, like, you know, people have loved your work. I've, I've loved your work. I mean, I, I think I've told you uh, at least once that, you know, you've, you've grown so much into that role. Um, mm -hmm. What, what got you there? And did you really enjoy it? Um, okay. So what because happened again, was, again, like first, you know, just yeah. to give context. So your background, just the way your life played out, mm. uh, in a way incentivized you to become, um, a, you know, to, 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 to do the job you've been doing all these years, right? right? A lot of investigation, a lot of kind of journalism, right? Mm. Uh, so in a way, being, being host uh, may play into a lot of attributes that you, current, that, that you have, charisma, uh, kind of, you know, this empathy, being able to have these conversations with everyone and make everybody feel good. Mm. Uh, so you did play onto some of your attributes, but did that really hit you, you know, into your soul? Um, it's it's a tough one. Like the the hosting work, uh, I I don't actually enjoy hosting. Okay. Uh, if if you can believe it, I don't I don't enjoy uh, the hosting. Um, a, a job or the hosting role but it was something that i identified that we only had one or two hosts that were doing it to a standard i knew as somebody that had studied broadcast journalism could do and even then i'd never really thought about it but it but uh robert olin he's been ceo at dreamhack suggested me for it but everyone else in the industry had always said, oh, Richard Lewis is too wild. You can't put him on this. You know, I, I, you can't put him on a podcast. You, you don't know what he's going to say. He's too crazy. And Robert Olin was like the first guy to take a chance and say, let's, let's make him a host. Right? How much damage can he do as a host? So I came in and I did a StarCraft event. And I just approached it pretty much like a regular desk anchor on a, on a talk show. Did you know about was... StarCraft? Or you just went with the flow? Nah, fuck no. I, I, mean, like, <laughs> I, I thought so. <laughs> yeah, I, follow, I followed the scene. Like, so I knew this player had beaten this player at this tournament. He had won this tournament. I knew all of that stuff. You know, but X's and O's, how to play the game? Fuck no. Fuck no. <laughs> I, 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 was, I was the first UK journalist to review the game. I was the first journalist. To, I pulled like a 36-hour no sleep play through the campaign and published my review on a website that's now defunct but i was the first uk guy to get a review out i, I went to the uh launch party for starcraft 2 i had the advanced copy i must have played it three or four times online it just ended the same way guy just built a bunch of cheap units i was trying to build something super sick and a bit more macro um i would just get completely run over in about three minutes guy would type noob that was that and I was like, yeah, okay, well, maybe RTS games aren't for me. Um, this isn't going to work. Uh, there's obviously something at play here uh, that I don't understand and will never get, and I'm not going to dedicate my life for this particular game because it doesn't float my boat. So I didn't do it. Um, but so I must have played about literally four games of StarCraft, but I was hosting the biggest StarCraft events. Um, okay. So that was because of robert olin but but what i what i then did was after i did a good job there i got offered more and more work and then it became like well this is what i do this is how i'm gonna make money this is how i'm gonna break away from having a regular job this is how i'm gonna put food on the table this is gonna supplement my journalistic income so then you have to do it you have to keep saying yes to the gigs but it's it, it, I've got a personality. I've got ideas. The host isn't supposed to do any of that. The host is supposed to go, so, Carlos, uh, what did you make of that Oriana play? You played some Oriana in your time, didn't you? And then I might be thinking, wow, that guy was shit. Like, and I, I, yeah, it was, <laughs> Too was so light. bad. Too unpolite for that shit. Yeah, but I can't say it, so I've got to ask you. And then you get to come in and go, wow, Richard, that was so bad, wasn't it? Really amateurish play from him. It was a bad pick from the start. He clearly isn't comfortable. You get to say all the cool shit. You get to make the show. Now, yes, I play a part that people don't realize. I have to ask the right question, frame everything the right way. But you know what I mean? Like, I have yeah. to... The, the, it's like putting yourself in a box and you play a character. That's what hosting is like. And I, it, it's not fun. Now I'll you know, do well, it. Well, there's one of the you get a check. There's one of the challenges actually mm -hmm. I, I have with look, I am I'm, I'm I consider myself um quite um mm -hmm. um I guess egocentric, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I, I 
you know, I tend to believe that everything goes around me to some degree, um, which you know, many times is an attribute, many times is a is a is a weakness. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, as a result, right, I got to realize, you know, I don't know if I'll if I'm done for this kind of mm. uh, podcast thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in a way, the the fact that this podcast exists is in order to challenge myself, right? And, and kind of learn new things and kind of learn how to drive a conversation when I'm not the most important figure of the conversation. And by the way, in every conversation, like it's just my nature. I just, I, I, I just embrace it because it's just my nature. I want to be the most important part of the conversation. I'll come in with the most relevant shit and I will try to make everyone believe the truth, which I'm the, I'm the best at whatever I'm talking about. Otherwise I don't talk. And, and, uh, this is really complicated for me to be in this current position. And, and in this challenge that I'm doing right now, it's actually teaching me many things that I, I, I didn't even think about before. First of all, I'm shit at listening. Like, I, I will just speak all the time, you know? Mm. And, the, and, and these podcasts are actually helping me out to learn how to listen to people. Uh, so what I mean with this and connecting the dots a little bit um, there is just a world in which, even though you, you didn't love being a host, the abilities you probably learned or the skills you probably learned being, yeah. the, being a host are going to be invaluable for you moving forward. That was especially true uh, in working for a TV company because I, they definitely helped me up my game. Like I, I felt I was pretty good. I felt I was one of the better hosts uh, that we had in esports before I went to E-League, like real talk. By by the end of E League, I, I think I am the number one host in esports. Like, sorry if that upsets anybody. Uh, I I think I, like I have I, I think I have a, like it, it was like a crash course. Now the knowledge in my head about timings and and I mean, show uh, flow League of Legends, and cameras. Uh, NA and you host are also. Mm. So yeah, I mean for 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 me. Um, I, I think out of all, you know, any game, I, I think I could go in and do any game right now and it would be up to that TV standard. People obviously will be upset because you're supposed to be humble or modest. I won't. I, I'm not going to do that. Like, I, I'll talk about my flaws, but I will also talk about the things I think I excel in. And I and I think the hosting role, even though it doesn't inspire me, I understood it mechanically enough to be able to do it well. And then what Ely gave me was me being able to do it the best. And then obviously the journalism, nobody broke stories like I broke. Like no, but nobody's put in the level of work on any of the stories before me. Um, and people are still struggling to come up to that standard subsequently. We've got a handful of journalists that are capable of that work, but there aren't many. Um, you know, that's why I say to people, like to the people who hate me and, and shit on me and like mad attractors, I haven't just been to the top of one field in esports. I've been to the top of two and I'll, I'll get to a third as well probably in my new job like that's right. fine you don't have to you don't have to like it but i'm not going to sit here and say i'm not proud of my achievement because i am because i worked incredibly hard and there's been a lot of sacrifices along the way to to get to that sort of summit of of those achievements so yeah it's um the the hosting role like i say it, it doesn't it's not creative and that's what i like to do i like to be creative that's and true. come up with ideas it's very reactive fun. with whatever happens yeah. in the game and yeah yeah, so I, I think, I, I, you know, it, it is what it is. But I'm looking forward to doing it less as I get older. I'm more, like, stuff like this. Being the interviewee, it's nice to be able to articulate my thoughts. Even though in that moment, you're like, oh, they're going to soundbite the bit where he says he's the best host in esports. And they're going to use that against me and say, look what an arrogant, conceited prick he is. Even though all <laughs> prior to that, I've talked about how I'm a flawed, three-dimensional human. You know, people just pick and choose. They hear what they want to hear based on what they already think about you so whatever you know if, fa- if, fact, if, they, don't, if they don't talk fact, about you if they don't talk about you that's actually much worse than being talked upon uh i i, I learned that lesson early on. Said, yeah. i i, I really said. learned a lesson very early very early on um so you mentioned uh, about your next job very briefly mm. um i want to give you kind of context before heading into the question itself yes. um you know throughout my life i've done multiple different things uh most of them uh kind of related to competition in some degree mm-hmm. although everything is actually competition i guess but uh, what i've come to realize is that you know when i was playing very young um, 
soccer, football, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or, or I was also playing paddle, which is like tennis, but with walls, right? Not in Spain. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I, it, it felt to me I, that, at that point in time that I was made for that. Then I started in esports and I was like, okay, all those abilities that I learned as a football player, as a tennis player, whatever, I could uh, translate into esports. So this is what I'm actually done for. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be an esports player and I'm, that's what I'm going to do, right? And then all of a sudden, I'm like, you know, I, I, you know, I quit my career and, and I mean, not that it happened like this, right? It, it, it took a long time for me to take decisions. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I now I look at my job, I look at my attributes and what I do on a daily basis, and mm -hmm. there are like three things that that define my success, which is competitive success. In other words, putting teams together that win. I understand game mechanics. I understand what kind mm -hmm. of combination of players will work best generally. Second, branding slash content creation, and third, how to sell competitive success and content creation both together. So those three things. And those three things are the things that I like doing the most, right? And I look at my career today and I'm like, so I'm done for this job. You know, maybe five to 10 years from now, maybe I'm fucking creating rockets uh, to go to Mars. You know, I'm just over, over extremizing. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but, but you know what I mean? And I will probably think I'm done for this job, right? So mm -hmm. it comes, it, it, I come to realize that you're done for whatever it is your ambitions end right so in mm -hmm. other words you keep learning and then you keep growing and as long as your ambition is still indefinite you keep growing and growing and growing how do you see your career path ending and how do you connect that with the upcoming job you have so for me my goal has always been by the time i hit 40 years old i'll be working for that's it there is there will be no can, can you repeat I, I actually didn't hear Did oh so yeah but, but yeah me uh, uh, for, by the time I'm 40, I will not have a boss. I will not have a recognizable job uh, as such. Um, it'll be content, it, completely independent content creation by me, for me, to my standards, and it'll all be, it'll all make money. And 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 that's where I'm headed. And I know I know I'm headed there. I already can feel it. You know, it's like 2018 is definitely going to be my breakout year in terms of content creation. Um, you know, I went from having like a, a podcast, the Richard Lewis show, where it was like 250, 300 hardcore people watching it. Now, every time I put it on, it's, it's 1200 people watching it. They're watching me and my producer, Sam goof off, talk about the news, talk about current events. We do buy the numbers with Thorin, obviously where he's lending his brand to it. We are getting 4,000 people listen to two guys talk about Counter-Strike. I think I'm going to be part of like this new wave of like podcast content that's um, you know coming out, and 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 podcasts are getting more and more popular now, especially yeah. on Twitch. And yeah. you know, people like you know, I've always been involved in the the big podcasts in esports, with the exception of Live on Three, which was really the first. You know, everyone owes DJ Wheat and Slasher and Scoots a huge debt because yeah. they were the first people to start an esports themed podcast. Um, you know, but I was on climbing the ladder i was on unfiltered which was you know very popular and then i went away and then we did by the numbers you know which was the alpha draft thing and i've always mm -hmm. been involved in like the talk radio aspect of esports and and twitch and that's where i'm gonna go that's what i'm gonna do and it'll just be it'll be me in a studio that i built in a house that i own and i'll be broadcasting to my audience and there'll be no concerns there'll be nobody taking my job away nobody taking my sponsors away nothing to worry about no bosses it'll just be me and my audience which is all own responsibility wanted. and own uh, just just your own little world yeah exactly that and, and that that's it that's all i've been working towards it comes back to you know i used to hump the miserable jobs I've had the miserable jobs, the jobs where your boss is a fucking tyrant and you wake up every day and you're like, I don't want to do this. I used to work in a fish and chip shop in Wales, right? Where my that job was to get up at 6 a.m. Oh, it was garbage. I used to get up at 6 a.m. and I used to have to carry sacks of potatoes from a dark, dank cellar up a flight of stairs that I had empty them into a bathtub full of water and then I would peel them by hand, get all the roots and eyes out, all the black bits of the potato, do that with a knife, and then I would have to pick up those potatoes and put them into something called a rumbler, which is a sideways washing machine, 
right? And it would take all the topsoil off and all the dirt that was left. And then when it had been in there for a while, I had to pick all those out in a bucket. And then I had to pour them into this thing that chopped them up. And it was all blades and potatoes would get stuck in it. And I'd have to put my fingers in. And it was super risky. And I'd have to take the potatoes out and put them into a big bin full of water. And then I had to put this thing in it called Stay White, which is a type of bleaching agent. Right, and if you inhale it, you lose your sense of smell and your sense of taste, and it's dangerous. And you have to put a scoop of that in, and then you leave that overnight, and then you rinse and repeat, and you do that over and over and over again. And I was doing that for three pounds an hour, right? Three pounds an hour. It was miserable. And every time my boss would come in and he would pick up the potato peel off the floor, and he'd said, "That's worth fifty pence worth of chips, Richard. I'm gonna fire you." It was awful. It was awful. And, I, and again, in those moments, I said, right, I am going to find something that works for me, that works to my talents. And by the time I am an adult, an actual adult with the final third of my life enemy, I will not be working for anyone ever again, ever. And that's where I'm going to be headed. So my career path is quite simple. This esports thing, I'm passionate about esports. That's not fake. I do genuinely care about it. But it's going to be my content after you know after it, whether it's about esports or not. That's what's going to be important. Like I've already cycled my audience now. Before I had an audience of people who wanted to hear what Richard Lewis had to say because they cared about esports. Now I've got an audience of people who want to hear what Richard Lewis has to say because they care about Richard Lewis. Right. That's that's a very different type of audience. And it's took me a long time to get there. But I, like I said, it's all it's going to take is one big personality to notice the podcast. I think it's great. I think it's good work. I'm immensely proud of what me and Sam do. I think the content's funny and fresh and not like anything else on Twitch. And it's going to get noticed and it's going to blow up. And it's going to help me get to the place where I want to be. Like I can, say, by the Can by you the repeat the name and, and, and how to find that? Just it's just called the Richard Lewis Show, and you can find it on my YouTube channel. Oh, you mean uh, that one? Yeah, I, I, I yeah. watched it. Yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah, it's yeah, it's Ali, right? It, it, I think I think it's good, and I think people like I say in 2019, I think that's going to be where it's like I have a better idea. Now, that's nothing to do with the work I'm doing now. Okay, but that's what I want to do long term. The work I'm doing now is it, it's going to be a super fun project. It's going to be awesome for esports, awesome for me, but it's not where I'm going to be in five years. Let's say. Are, are you, are you, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, v vanity, vanitus, vani, ve, how do you call that? Vain? Vain. Thank you very much. That's yeah, a, no worries. Like, what if, I, <laughs> if I'm like conceited? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think it's just like, in other being... words, when is your, when is the next R8? Uh, for me? <laughs> um, well, I know, <laughs> I mean, but I'll never, I'll, ne I'll never have that. I'm never, I'm not fucking motivated. I don't care about money. Like, I only ever talk about money when people come to me and say, ha ha, you're a loser, your life's pathetic, grow up. And I think, right, okay. So I, I just hit them with, the, well, what do you do for a living? And how much do you earn? And how good is your... Oh, but yeah, oh, now you all do is talk about money. <laughs> it's like, they want it both ways, right? They want to call me a fucking loser and say I'm a joke. And it's like, well, look, being, being this brand of loser has got me a fucking nice six-figure salary, put me on national you know national television in america what the fuck do you do you know like don't I, I i enjoy what i do and i take pride in what i do and if you do the same fine but people who are secure in what they do for a living don't come and attack other people for what they do for a living um okay well by the way the, the, i think the bot just mentioned that we should stay hydrated <laughs> yeah yeah I, I love that bot by the way uh, it's um it's very useful uh on twitch where people do need to drink more water <laughs> but but yeah, so um, I'll never have an R8. I, I never would. I don't even buy like nice clothes. I don't give a fuck about okay. any of that status nonsense. It's 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 gibberish. Uh, I'll tell you this: <laughs> Mo Mo will sell that R8. Right? Mo will sell that car. I read that. I read that. But he, he will buy another car. It. I mean, he bought yeah, a McLaren. Yeah, and then he'll sell that. Yeah, and then he'll and then he'll sell it. You know, it, it's it's none of these things are practical. None a of these things car, matter. Right? It's yo, of course, yeah, wicked if, if you like that kind of thing. For me, the, the important thing has always been the work, reaching people, having people enjoy the work. That's worth more to me than 
any of the money. Like, as long as I've got enough to pay the rent and keep a roof over my, over, over my head and keep the internet on, I don't really give a fuck about and keep beers in the fridge. I don't give a fuck about anything else. I'm like, telling you, man, I, I, I have felt great um, when I was broke. I have felt miserable when I was broke. I have felt mm. great when I was uh, not broke. And I have felt also miserable um, when, when, again, when, when things were smiling for me. So uh, in a way, you actually do get used to that certain standard. At some point, you're like, you know, going into yacht trips, things like that. Stop meaning that much to you, really. So mm -hmm. you actually make up your own meaning for these things uh, mm -hmm. to some degree. Um, and and it, it, it's all about, you know, I, I, at the end of the day, the, from the people I know that I know are happy, regardless of, of their economic situation, they tend to be on the optimistic side for some reason. I don't know why, but not, not this Pollyanna bullshit that is like the, the new wave of bullshit actually going on, but, but the, the true kind of optimism, like looking at the, at the, at the, at the, at the good side of everything that happens, right? Uh, and, and, and I do see that these people tend to be more happy overall. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I, like I say, for me, you've got to put the, the secret to like enjoying life is finding something that you ge genuinely do care about. First of all, not being afraid to take some time to do that. I feel sorry for young people because there's a lot of pressure to sort of know who you are by the time you're like 18, and it's bullshit. I didn't have a clear idea about where I wanted to go and how I was going to do it like till my mid 20s. I had to explore and make mistakes and fuck up and do this and do that. Um but once you've found it, like just fully commit to it. Like nothing like listen, I, I know it's not everyone's going to succeed. This isn't a follow your dream speech. Most of you probably will fail. That's just the odds. But what what, what is fail, uh, Richard? Like what is actually Yeah, fail? Right, exactly. If exactly, if you and define what is if yeah, if you define failure as not achieving everything you set out to do, then yes, you absolutely will fail. The vast majority of you will. It, this isn't, a, like I say, it's not about follow your dreams, and if you work hard enough, you'll get it. That's hugely disrespectful to all the people who work hard and fail anyway. But the, the reality is that if you attach yourself to the pursuit of something you care about, failure and success is no longer like a win or lose state. It's, it's, it's the pursuit itself that matters. It's getting up and doing it. Like for me, it was it became very quickly about the journalism, and I thought as exactly. long as I'm getting up and writing a story that I know it, it is going to matter. It doesn't matter if a thousand people read it or a hundred thousand people read it. It doesn't matter whether I get paid, you know, a thousand dollars per hundred words or if I get a thousand dollars a month. It doesn't matter because I, that's what I care about. The process is what's important to me, and it, as long as I get up every day and I'm that... doing it. If you can kick that one thief out of the industry, that's rewarding enough <laughs> for that piece. Yeah, exactly, right? That's all. That, that's the, literally all I ever cared about. Um, and, and I've never, I don't judge my success on money or following or numbers. I think it's quite sad when you see like YouTubers and streamers and they're like, you know, you see these guys who they've got like, all right, so there's people like, I don't know, I, th I think like Mitch Jones is a good example of this. You know, they sit there on their stream and they've got like 2,500, 3,000 people watching them. I think that's great. 3,000 people are taking time out of their day to sit and like interact with you virtually and listen to what you have say and watch play games and you know give you some money and all they do is piss and moan like oh i had twelve thousand last month why does no one watch my stream like, how can you think so little of the three thousand people that turned up so true man you know, I, re if you I remember when, when i started streaming bro in in, in on 3d i remember mm -hmm. i started the stream with like 12 viewers it was fucking it was it, i mean they were my 12 viewers and i was enjoying the shit out of that stream as a matter of fact and this is actually beautiful you know, I've been a legend. This is fact. I've been a legendary player. I've been the biggest esports brand from an individual player perspective up until I stop playing the game. Yeah. Um, and today I stream and I get literally fucking 500 people, right? And many yeah. people are like, what, what are you, what are you, why are you doing this for? You know? And I, I just enjoy so much knowing that those 500 guys 
the vast majority will have seven children and be 40 years plus because otherwise, why the fuck would you be a fan of Ocelot? Like, he's just old as fuck. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the other half are joining the, 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 the stream and saying, who the fuck is this guy? You know, he doesn't even play well the game. Uh, so, and, and I just enjoy myself having those 500 people watching uh, mm. and making their day and making jokes and just, I'm just happy, you know? And again, I'm I'm not doing obviously this for money or anything. I'm doing it because it's just so fucking fun. And if those people that have 12 viewers today would embrace every single one of them, their chances of succeeding would just skyrocket. And this is a constant, like this is just literally constant. Every single stream or most of the streamers that are successful today or content creators, just they were just happy with like 50 fucking views. They were just happy, you know? No, like, I know it's it's crazy though, people. Uh, yeah, people people don't understand, like streamers don't understand, it doesn't last forever. Like, especially if your type of content is reliant on a particular game, a yep. particular fan. That's a good point. You know, it doesn't last forever. Like, so, you know, I remember Night Blue. Oh, yeah. When Night, when Night Blue was like the number one League of Legends stream, right? Um, they, uh... Now, now there was a period where he was making like one point two million dollars a year just from that was just on like you know subs and whatever, um, and was doing incredibly well. And I used to listen to his content and be like, "Wow, this guy's just a fucking whiny bitch." Like, like I don't understand why anyone <laughs> would want to listen to this at all. It's fucking awful. He's not that good. Uh, seems incapable of like understanding. He's fallible. Um, yeah. Like, this will get old real quick, I think. And lo and behold, if you go back and you look at the streamers who were the, at the top two years ago and you look at the top streamers now, it's not the same people. What matters is the longevity, the longevity, the small growth, not the shooting up and rising to fame, because then the streamers have these like mad and realistic expectations that it's going to last forever. And yep. when it doesn't, when they're back to streaming to a thousand people, they think they've lost. They don't understand that, okay. You've still got a core audience here. How do you diversify? How do you make your content more interesting? I've never heard a streamer on stream when their numbers go down say, listen, guys, while you're all here, how do I make my content better? Like, they think no they one ever, made it they, and they think yeah. they're here. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, they never ask that question. They never ask that question. Um, they, they, they assume that it's like, oh, Everything else peripherally is against me. Everything else is, you know, it, uh, the trends, the game, the game's just bad now. If Riot hadn't have killed League of Legends, I'd still have, like, it's like, yep. guy, you know, you're a personality. Completely you, diluted. Yeah, you're a personality. You do understand. You don't have to, like, again, look at PewDiePie. Do you remember PewDiePie when he used to play those, the games and just be like, yeah! I'm screaming at the game and you were like fucking hell now he actually makes content that has some thought into it some substance oh. and his audience has kind of grown up with him and he's one of the most you know pop popular figures in any media in the world you know he was already a phenomenon sure back when he was terrible but at least he grew and evolved and made better content right like most streamers don't do that they fucking cry about how the game everything's against them and and where did their audience go and how it's not fair they never actually look at making their content better it, it's ridiculous so yeah i almost feel sorry for streamers who think it's gonna last forever yeah and, and people don't don't realize this but you know ninja right now is in the highest point anyone has ever been at and and, and tomorrow yeah. what will happen is that a new game will pop and there will mm -hmm. be a new ninja that will not be called ninja that mm -hmm. will multiply by 10 the current uh, the the current uh, you know the current number of viewers uh. of ninja and people will just forget about ninja and one day ninja may be in his living room uh, and just thinking to himself the fuck just happened like yeah no I, I know and no one's preparing him for that as well like it, it's yep. It, again, it's like that seems very about not, with Tyson and it. Conor McGregor, right? They have these entourages now in esports, and the amount of people who are just sticking their tongue in Ninja's arsehole and just trying to ride his fucking fame. It's like you know, there's a bunch of like the COD motherfuckers that do this. Like, there's a guy called Maven. Like, Ma Maven literally compared. Um, he quoted Martin Luther King. <laughs> uh, because people didn't believe that the whole Drake thing was organic. 
To him, it was as bad that people didn't believe Ninja was telling the truth. It was as what? bad as, like, the civil rights movement. I know, these people are so divorced from reality, it's fucking mind-blowing. And it's like, listen... Ninja's a very popular streamer. Popular and good aren't the same thing, but I'm not going to come out and say, like, oh, you know, he, you know, he's done... Some, he, there's some fucked up skeletons in his closet, but we already talked about that as well. Who doesn't have those? I didn't like it when, for example, his top donator bankrupted himself, then tried to scam some money back because he was... He was bankrupted, and then Ninja came out and said about a guy who had donated over $100,000 to him, how dare you betray me like this? Like... You know, hopefully, you know, now that Ninja's making all this money, he goes back to that guy who gave him $100,000 and helps him out of the huge financial hole he got himself in by giving Ninja $100,000, but whatever. Um, the bottom line is, like, Ninja, Ninja's I mean, I didn't know not... You know, it, there's loads. But people just forget about it when it's like, Ninja's popular now, so he's wholesome. Like, he said the N-word on stream um, the other day, and everybody bent over backwards to apologize and explain it away, saying, oh, but he was singing along to a rap song. Yeah, a song that doesn't have the N-word in. It's just double standards because he's popular right now. And, and you're absolutely right and on point in the same way that back when Ninja was, you know, the H1Z1 guy, who held the record and he was getting decent numbers, you can't compare that to the guy who's playing with Drake. Now, a lot of people, I'm sure, are going to be like, this is it, we it's going to last forever. It's not going to last forever. It never lasts forever. And unfortunately, his content isn't interesting enough in its current form that if Fortnite were ever to fall off, he would stand alone as a personality. He's very bland and drab, and he appeals to a child demographic because of that right and everyone's super happy for him to appeal to that child demographic because it's good for business and that's fine i'm not even disputing any of that as i'm not saying that's a bad thing go make your money and and, and make hay while the sun shines but if people think we're going to be here like two years from now still talking about how ninja propelled gaming into the mainstream which, of course, gaming is the mainstream, by the way, in case no one's been paying attention for the past 10 years, and, and saved esports and all this other stuff. Come on, it, we'll, be, we'll be talking about someone else. We'll be polishing someone else's dick in two years. That's the game. That's how it works. The people who have been around for a long time and grind and diversify, they're the people I always respect, not the fucking fad streamers that blow up, because they're, they're nowhere to be seen in two years. I, uh, life. With that said, I, I do appreciate so very much uh, people that challenge the status quo. Um, I can give you a few examples. Uh, you know, Doctor Disrespect. Uh, yeah, like that that kind of stream and that kind of uh, production quality. Like no one did that kind of shit before, mm. consistently, uh, or created a character. You know that may not be, may, may not be how he really is in real life so creating an actual character is just so you know above yeah. what we've seen until this day or what Illy did in terms of production quality or what uh, paris saint germain esports did in terms of video production quality that they just raised the bar yeah and it's just so fucking good you know it's just that just raises the bar for everybody else you know yeah and unfortunately he he also fell into a, a trap um, I talked about it in a video like I, that was cut from one of my streams. Again, it, he was another person that went from being a guy that had designed levels for Call of Duty, you know, a map designer and, 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 a, and like a community guy. He created a persona, put all this work into it, created this brilliant character, did things on Twitch that no one had ever done before and had set a new high bar for streaming and just all around streaming is an entertainment experience. I hadn't seen anything like that really since yep. Trick 2G. Yeah, yeah. When Trick sure. 2G first came out and he was like... Trick 2G fucking... was fucking good too. Like... Oh, dude. Like, when I used to watch him wrecking people with you, dear, even though I was moving away from League at that time and, like, dropping hip-hop lines and laid a bitch yeah. and all this, like... Yeah, you know, uh, laughing straight to the bank, playing in the background. I thought it was fucking hilarious. I even wrote an article called The Most Entertaining Motherfucker on Twitch because he was like more of an adult kind of entertainer, but he was playing League. So I really respected that. But like I say, Dr. Disrespect completely raised the bar for streaming as an entertainment experience. But unfortunately, with all that attention and with all that money came ego, poor judgment, um, um, we know where he is right now, where unfortunately for something where I don't think he should necessarily 
have to suffer for it because I don't think it's anyone's business in the it's streaming It's not anyone's world. business, exactly. Yeah, you know, whatever, I, dude. Like, yeah, but unfortunately, every time he logs into stream now, stream sniper's going to be trying to get a funny, amusing name whenever he plays a game. He can even go and play a game like World of Tanks and people are trying to do it. And I, I think it's a shame. You can see it's really starting to grind him down and affect him, but unfortunately, that's the nature of the business. When you're a celebrity... That's what comes with the territory. So it's kind of a shame what happened to the doc. But again, it's a cautionary tale. If you blow up too fast and your ego gets the better of you and you don't stay grounded and you make bad decisions, there are people out there on the internet who will remind you of those bad decisions every day <laughs> for the rest of your life because they've got nothing better to do with their time. I, I do appreciate the hustle, though. Like, you know, going through this very hard moments and mm. just, you know, reset, go back, return, and just be there, you know, be there, just nonstop, be there, be there, be there. Three years from now, people will remember for other things, right? And, yeah. and you know, with all of us, again, you've gone through the same shit, I've gone through the same shit. People remember you for other shit. You know, mm -hmm. people tend to forget, or not forget, but there's so much stuff happening throughout the years that people can't keep up, you know? <laughs> That's, uh, at some point, you just, you just, they don't even, you know, if I tell you how many times, I got mentioned the fucking word backdoor. Your fucking eyeballs would get out of your <laughs> eye sockets. <You> know? <laughs> yeah, and it just, just get over it, you know, and it just doesn't affect you anymore. I mean, uh, so, you know, I just appreciate that hustle. I appreciate being able to come in, uh, you know, every day to stream and with as much energy as he can. And, and if he keeps doing that, he's going to get out of the hole. I have no doubts in my mind. Maybe not with 30K viewers, maybe with, with, with 5K. And then he will have to hazard his way up again. And if he yeah. really does that, he's going to be fucking indestructible. The same way you you and I are today. We are just fucking relentless. Like, I'm you can't destroy me. I, I just can't die. I'm just a parasite forever there. I can't well, die. Listen, you, you do yourself a disservice because what you did is super rare. So, so rather than, you know, fellate myself, I'll, I'll fellate you for a moment. <laughs> um the uh the the sort of transition of going from being a very popular professional player a brand in their own right to then going to like marketing things off the strength of that brand to then going to being a manager owner of a company to then rebrand that company and become like a ceo and of of one of the more if not the most successful kind of European esports brand, there hasn't been many players that have had a journey that's anything like yours, right? This is what I mean. Like, it, it, it's insane to me. If there was anyone out there who would be so, like, reductive of your achievements as well, you know, like, you think about where, back when it was uh, Gamers 2, to, <laughs> right? The magic to, word. <laughs> yeah, to where we are now with G2 esports and all the ups and downs and the arguments and Twitter and the disagreements. And, and 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 the dramas and the hard work. That's what I'm talking about, man. It's yeah. a lot has rained, you know. And and yeah. at the end of the day, uh, Mark Cuban said one thing that I think is so totally right, bro. Like, you will fuck up left, right, and center. You just have to be right once. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and it's just so so true. Um, for every content piece that we consider today um, successful. I've done 10 in the past that have been shit. For every good PR move you see today that we that we had, we've done 10 shitty PR moves in the past, you know? And you just have to be right once and then go on with it. Learn the lesson and repeat, repeat, develop, improve it. And people end up really, people, they have too much shit in their lives to keep up with your with your historic shit. Like you probably have heard about this choking inc incident more times than you're happy to hear about, and at oh, some sure. point it will run. It will run out. It will just at some point it will just run out. That's a matter of fact, and you just have yeah, to. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. But I think the problem you've got with social media is there's like this uh, kind of game of telephone that happens, right? They hear the rumor on yeah, Reddit, and then, right. and then they and then they repeat, and it changes. One of the things I'm super grateful for my fans for doing, and it was like kind of like illuminating, actually. It it it, it shows it, it's taught me a lesson about how to handle stuff like this. What they did was instead of 
publicly challenging the lie every time it was repeated that Richard Lewis attacked Loda at this event, which is a complete fabrication. Instead of saying that is a lie, where's your proof? Where's this? Where's that? What they started doing was going, yes, Richard Lewis took Loda when he was 12 years old and power bombed him through a table at SummerSlam and you know, and oh yes, Richard Lewis uh, beat Loder up because Loder said he didn't like Hitler, and they they made the story more and more ridiculous. And now every time it gets brought up, there's just a chain of replies from people just with all this disinformation, and it it that is actually better than trying to change people's minds and make them realize that the version they have heard is fake. They are what what my fans now go out and do is basically say, look, th what you're saying is absurd, and it's as absurd as this lie that I'm about to tell. And I think that's a yeah, great I, way I, to deal with I've, it. I've now. seen that. I, I've seen that. Actually, you have Tifo now. You have uh, huge, huge fans defending you, which uh, mm. yeah, the, the, I, I've, se I've seen a lot of those, actually, for G2 as well, for Fnatic, for even Origin. Like It doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. <laughs> they actually defend you. I, I, I love that. I love that. Yeah. No, and, it, and, it, and it, it's been really helpful, actually, like from a psychological standpoint. Like, I don't want people to go out there and fight my battles all the time. And I don't want to reduce my audience into being like a personal army that goes out there and corrects things that I think are wrong on, on, on the uh, Internet. But like, it, it is important to me to know that there are people out there that aren't just going to let the lies take hold. Right. That there are people out there that will that know the truth that will not let my reputation continue to be smeared and will go out there and have my back in, in as much as they can. That is more important to me than, like, say, maybe somebody can't afford to subscribe, right? Maybe somebody, you know, uh, doesn't want to follow me on Twitter even because I, I tweet a lot of stuff they don't like. But if they're willing to go out and do that on my behalf and sort of help, like, just steer away, like, some of the lies, that means way more to me than any sort of financial contribution, which isn't to be reductive about the financial contribution, but it shows that these people care enough about my reputation, not, which is more important to me than my bank balance. So that always, that always meant a lot to me when I saw stuff like that. All right. Well, you know, I would be here forever. Mm. Uh, with you, uh, probably just got to wrap it up, right? Yeah, you know it's it's eleven o five p.m. for mm. me. I typically at this point in time, I'm I'm already sleeping uh, about about every day, even including weekends. Uh, now with a son and all that, he literally wakes me up at like seven a.m. punching my face. Like this is legit. Wow. He punches my face because I I showed him a word which is called puño, which is in, in Spanish, which means punch. Right? I mean, with, like right. uh, sorry, fist. Sorry. So he uh -huh. just says puño, puño on my face all the time, you know, uh, early on. So it's there's no way I can sleep in the mornings anymore. So I'm forced by default to go to bed early, uh, even though I'm a gamer and it it's, it it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't connect with me too well, <laughs> but I'm well. forced to. Yeah, make make sure you if he's got uh, if he's got a good right arm on him, a good right hook on him. Make sure you get him down a boxing gym. Absolutely, you, you know, I, yeah. I I I told Rose, I, I I told I told her, listen, as soon as he can he can like you know consistently kind of move his arms and like we we gotta put him in some some killing martial art, you know, just yeah. <laughs> just to make sure he has kind of that background. Anyway, bro. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll let you do it, your thing. Um, so thanks very much for having me on, and thanks to all the people who tuned in. Uh, I don't often get to do these type of things, so it was nice of you to invite me. I really appreciate it. Nah, I appreciate you in here, man. Um, really, thanks a lot. I enjoyed a lot. I, I learned a lot from a lot from views as well. And even though uh, it, it wasn't really a lot about esports, I enjoyed probably this, this podcast actually the most out of every single Thank podcast we, we've made. It's the fourth one. Um, so man, again, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm pretty sure you have a lot of fans in the chat, a lot of haters, which is a good thing too. Always. Um, and I hope to see you soon, brother, in, in, in events, okay? Yeah, yeah, make sure you get out here. Like, next time you're in Vegas, I'll show you a good time. Abso absolutely, Vegas as well. Actually, I'm going to Vegas. Actually, this not a, yeah, I'm, I'm going to Vegas fairly soon. I have a round trip, Vegas, San Francisco, Chicago, New York. So, right. As soon as you're in Vegas, hit me up. I'll I'll take you out anywhere. This is my town now. I run this shit. Jesus. So. Jesus. Yeah. All right, man. Love you very much. Yeah, Richard. you too. You take right. care, brother. Thank you very much. For the rest of you guys uh, that stay there, I just want to thank you so very much for being here. Um, you know, I I'm I'm not I'm not a a. This is the, my my fourth episode. Of this shit. Okay. 
and I'm enjoying myself so very much. I'm learning new things. Uh, I love interacting with you guys. To be honest, I would have loved to be able to add in some of your questions from Twitter and so on. I'm very sorry that wasn't the case, but this conversation was so engaging and it was so rich. Uh, oh, Rich, Richard, you get it? Sorry for the bad joke. It's, it's late, okay? Um, I enjoyed it so very much. Um, with that said, I have two things for you. Well, actually, they are for me, but uh, I'll show you. One of them is for all of you that are tuning in from the US. Oh, say can you. This is going on sale soon. And more importantly, for them and men like me that are so alpha that they can wear this pink jersey and feel proud about it. Man, I will wear this on the street, okay? And I will enjoy every minute. Look at this beautiful jersey. By the way, you're only seeing this for the first time. This hasn't been posted anywhere. Um, this is not for females. There will be a female cut, but this is like a, this is, this is male cut. So this will be, oh, it will be also for men. I, I love it. I absolutely um, Anyway, we'll post it on social media at some point, but you guys get to see it first because you guys are our podcast viewers you see that's the some of the perks of watching this podcast needless to say i love you so very much and i hope you'll be there with me either next week or the week after when we go for the a podcast episode five i think we're gonna bring perks this next time I'm, we're gonna try okay otherwise we're gonna see who else we can bring love you so very much Stay cool, stay awesome. G2 Army, we love you. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show. With that said, you know, this show exists because of you guys. We want to teach you about esports, we want to entertain you, and for that reason, please provide us with which topics do you think we should be speaking about, which people do you want us to invite. And um, yeah, with that said, please head over to g2esports.com slash shop. Uh, we do our best efforts to create the best possible merchandise for you guys. So please check it out, uh, buy anything you like, and 